great to see you today, and welcome. Welcome to the Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live from uh, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, and our studio on Capitol Hill right down the street from the United States Capitol Building here in the shadow of the dome where President Obama gave his big State of the Union speech, number five, on Tuesday night. And yesterday he was out on the road carrying his message around the country. His first stop, a Costco up in Latham, Maryland, uh, about 15 miles up the road, where Costco pays its employees a minimum of 11 bucks an hour. And the president talking about the need to raise a minimum wage and telling workers there, nobody who works for a job full-time should have to live in poverty in this country. And then he was off to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, nearby, visiting a steel plant, uh, a great union plant by the uh, United Steel Workers. Their president, Leo Gerard, was there at the plant with him yesterday. The president talking about bringing jobs back to America today. He'll visit a General Electric's plant in Milwaukee and then a high school down in Nashville, Tennessee, again with that same message of equal opportunity and doing something to remedy the problem of income inequality in this country. The House also passed a farm bill before it uh, left town again. But the big news, of course, is the weather, and the biggest weather news is coming from places that just are not used to cold weather, snow, and ice, uh, particularly in Atlanta and Birmingham. Thousands of people spending the night in their cars, in supermarkets, in restaurants, in strangers' homes. And they finally, it looks like, have the roads cleared. Lots coming up right here on Free Speech TV and Talker TV. This is The Bill Press Show. In the early 20th century, the war to end all wars didn't end war at all. It stoked the fires of change. A traumatized world was ripe for change. The world was ready for modernism. Modernists wanted to forget history, or at least reinterpret it. More than just a style, modernism applied to virtually all forms of creative expression. Innovative artists like Picasso, Escher, Dali, they all started looking at their world differently. Other artists tried painting light itself. These were the Impressionists. Surrealists went a bit further. We had entered the age of the isms. Cubism, symbolism, futurism, constructivism. All these new modern ways of looking at the world blew people away. When it came to architecture, Mm. modernists were intrigued by emerging technology. Concrete, glass and steel featured heavily in their buildings. Modernists believed Mm. that they could design a better society. Ornamental indulgence was considered a frivolous waste of effort. They thought function should always dictate form and that mankind's intelligence, creativity and capability for radical thinking should be celebrated. Take the Russian inventor Georgi Krutikov. He suggested an idea for a city held aloft by electrical currents. This at a time when there was barely enough wattage to keep the lights on. Not everything they designed was a resounding success. But you could argue modernism was the single most influential movement of the 20th century. From house music to house wares, Tables and chairs to graphic design all have been created by the aesthetics and ideas of modernism. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, Turn down the AC, or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket. And it's always in the the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them. But, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
broadcasting around the nation on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. President Obama says uh, nobody who is working for a living with a full-time job should have to live in poverty in this country. Amen to that. Good morning, everybody. How about it? On a Thursday, here we go, Thursday, January 30. Great to see you today. We're just suiting up and getting ready here for another three hours together to talk about the news of the day, what's going on all around the country, what's going on, if anything, here in Washington, D.C., what's going on in your neighborhood and around the globe, and what do you think about it? It's the Bill Press Show. Welcome. Welcome to the program. Hope you are staying warm, and uh, that is harder to do uh, than you think it might normally be in many, many, many parts of the country. Relief kind of on the way, but another cold one today before it starts to warm up. When we say warm up, it's all relative, um, but it may may not be sub-zero Uh, over the weekend, just down around the zero or in the single digits or low doubles. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, don't forget, we not only uh, love the fact that you are listening uh, in the car, at home, at your office, on your local progressive talk radio station. We also love the fact that you are watching us on Free Speech TV. If you got a satellite dish, Direct TV is where you find us, or on the Dish Network. And uh, we love having you in our, uh, on our video stream and in the chat room on the video stream all around the globe at TalkerTV, youtube.com slash TalkerTV, that special new channel. We are the flagship show yes, sir. on TalkerTV. And uh, here we go, another cold day, but another full team here, Peter Ogburn and Elisa Murphy. Hello, hello. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning. Good morning. Ready to go? Thursday, yeah, man. Yeah, Thursday. Alicia Cruz. I know, we're getting our second favorite. Alicia Cruz here. She's uh, ready to take your calls, 866-55-PRESS. You know how to do it, 866-55-PRESS. And uh, you can send us your comments, too, on Twitter at BP Show and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. And uh, last but not least, of course, Cyprian Bolding, our videographer, who keeps us um, uh, looking the best he can do with what he's got to work with. Uh, <laughs> <on> his, <laughs> his raw materials are, you know. Yeah, you know. I appreciate the mood lighting he puts on me. You know, you got to have that those filters on these. But, you know, we do uh, try to bring you all the uh, – good morning, Cyprian. Yeah, sorry. We, we do uh, try to bring all the big stories of the day every day. Sometimes – Something happens and we just blow it. We just miss it. I just want to apologize for that and, and admit that. You know, you can't always get everything right. I don't know how it happened, but yesterday we let January 29 pass without recognizing the significance of that day. It is Cyprian's birthday. It sure. was Cyprian's birthday yesterday. But you know, you, these days you don't celebrate just for like one day. Right, exactly. You celebrate. Maybe for a month, days. right? Yeah, yeah, At least yeah. a week, a yeah. whole several days. Yeah. So, Cyprian, happy birthday! And, and, and when you turn fifty-three years old, I know like Cyprian, it's worth taking a moment. You take out. a moment. It's a big day. It's such a big day uh, that I think we have to have a special <laughs> guest come in. And I and would love. Can we think, do the full version? The full, the, the full, full Monty from John Boehner this morning. Yes. This is your birthday song. <laughs> it doesn't last too long. Hey. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Is exactly camera, like the first you, verse. Oh, Let's don't sing it. <laughs> this is your birthday song. It doesn't last too long. Hey, happy birthday, Ralph. <laughs> Very nice. Save the tape. Save the tape. Cyprian, yeah. I'm going to need a copy of that, buddy. Uh, yeah, right. I want that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> he jumped out of the birthday cake this morning. Uh, look, for those of you not watching on TV, Cyprian just came in here in his birthday suit. <laughs> that's and, it. I mean, you, you all, uh, you all you missed should... it. Oh, come on. He did have a hat on. Oh, that's right. No, he did. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, happy birthday, Cyprian. Happy birthday. Happy Cyprian. birthday. Boy, I'm telling you. 
That's worth waiting a whole year for to see Damn that. Right, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> Uh, that's not the only news that we got today. Uh, not the only. We got a big lineup today. The president of the steelworkers, Leo Gerard, was there with President Obama last yesterday. He'll tell us all about it right here on the show this morning. Kevin Cirilli from Politico will be in uh, to uh, help us through as a friend of Bill and the former head of the prisons council, prison guards uh, working for the federal government of federal prisons from the American Federation of Government Employees will be here to talk about some of the particular problems that they are facing with overcrowding in our federal prisons. And we'll, of course, catch up with the president's message yesterday about the minimum wage and unemployment insurance. All of that coming up, but first... This is the Full Court Press. I'm not sure if I'm ready. I'm not sure if I'm fully recovered. From I, I know. That was... Good grief. All right. A Long Island exotic fish dealer confessed to illegally importing nearly 40,000 razor tooth piranhas from Hong Kong to Queens. The gentleman by the name of Joel Rackhauer. Wait, 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 are they are they in aquariums or tanks, or did you put them tank. in the river? No, 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 they're, oh, no, 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 no oh. you put them in the river. Oh, but he's been bringing them in for several <laughs> years and oh. selling them to people. Uh, he agreed to pay more than seventy thousand dollars in fines. And many yeah, why you can't import piranhas? You cannot import piranhas. You cannot you cannot import piranhas to sell as pets. Really? Which is the problem. Yeah, but he also sold them as other fish. He labeled them as uh, silver tetras oh, to get around oh. the NYC piranha prohibition of 2011. Hmm. So I guess you're not allowed. I didn't realize that you're not allowed to sell them because. Well, I mean, if you because get a, kids could buy them and then have their fingers have their fingers shoot off, or if you have them and you set them loose somewhere, you know, they could they could disrupt the whole system. It's it's. It's just not a good idea to let piranhas lose in America. Yeah, I'd rather, you know, not have no know the piranhas are not in my. Yeah. You know, if I'm taking a swim and. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm better without the piranha. Uh, yeah. The idea that you would swim in the East River it, right. it's pretty far fetched, anyhow. But right. yeah. If you are trying to lose weight this year, here are a couple of foods you might want to avoid, but there might not be the ones that you're thinking of. Here are the seven most common items thought to be healthy foods that are not actually mm -hmm. all that healthy. Number one on right, the list, me. muesli. Muesli. Like, yeah. Stay like, away from that. Like, uh, Second, oatmeal. So yeah, so oatmeal, like, granola, Swiss, things, things like Swiss. that. It's yeah, good. It's yeah. good. But it's not very good for I you. I never eat it anyhow. Second, so. banana chips. Number uh, really? also on the list. How about it, bananas? Bananas are okay, but the banana chips a lot of times they add sugar and things like that to make them sweeter. Okay. And, okay. Uh, energy bars. You don't eat energy bars unless you plan on going for a very long. So a lot of people eat these energy bars, and then they just go do like a thirty-minute workout where it gives you so many calories for an extended workout. Trail mix very bad for you, and also trail mix, and also on the list. Oh, not mm -hmm. bad for you, but it, for in well, terms not, of they adding should be considered pounds, health huh? foods. Yeah. I mean, they're they're high in calories. Here's the here's the issue, right? So you get these. What things. can you eat? You get these things and you eat them. You think you're being healthy, but then you don't go work out. Got it. And then they just sort of stick with you. Okay. There's a lot also of calories. Of reduced fat yogurt. Not Greek yogurt. That is a big, big difference. Greek yogurt is okay, but if it labels itself as reduced fat yogurt, oh, no. you don't. This want to says non-fat yogurt. That's okay. My Chobani this morning. It's all right. We're safe. All right. Okay. We're okay with that. Thank you. Anyway. And final story, final story, an employee at a Pittsburgh McDonald's restaurant was charged Wednesday with selling heroin in Happy Meals. Customers would show up at the McDonald's. Talk about a Happy Meal. And, yeah, exactly. Now you know why this, that fast food is so addictive. Customers had learned that there's a coded request. If you drove through, you'd get to the window and you'd say, I'd like to order a toy to the, ver to the specific person at the window. And she would know that that was time to sell you heroin. An informant told the police they showed up. They set up a drug buy and arrested a 26-year-old female when they show when they went through the drive-thru and got 10 bags of heroin in a Happy Meal box. Oh, but did you get the Happy Meal You don't it? actually get the Happy Meal. Oh, yeah. You just get the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We're pretty clever. We get more and more uh, crap. Well, look, we're, you know, every morning... Um, uh, well, the day before, we start talking about the next day's show. That evening, we talk a little more detail about the next day's show. We get here early in the morning before the cows get up even. And uh, we talk uh, about the, finally what we're going to talk about on that show. And we're always looking for the biggest news stories of the day where we start off and what you're going to want to talk about. 
There's no doubt. There's only one story that's dominating everything today, and that is this freaking weather. It is unlike anything we've ever seen before. I mean, we've seen the stories of huge traffic jams and people stuck out in the snow and um, you know, running low on heating oil and um, all, all that kind of stuff. And s- s- schools out and, and schools shut down and businesses shut down and whole cities shut down. But it's always like Fargo, North Dakota, right? Or a lot of times it's Chicago, a lot of Chicago, Chicago. It's Boston. It's Maine. It's all. No, these stories this week are Alabama yeah. and particularly Atlanta. On Believable. Yesterday in Atlanta, some 10,000 kids spent the night last night in schools in Atlanta because they couldn't get home. It wasn't safe to take them home in the school buses. People uh, people spent the night in supermarkets. They just went, got out of their cars, parked their cars. I mean, the, the, the freeways there were just like a parking lot. Yeah. Uh, school buses, trucks, cars everywhere. A lot of people abandoned their cars. Uh, a lot of people couldn't. They were afraid to uh, also. But those who did got out of the cars, went into restaurants. I saw uh, 45 people spent the night in a Harvey's restaurant somewhere just outside or in Atlanta or just outside of Atlanta. Uh, they went into supermarkets, said, can we come in and stay warm? Ended up spending the entire night there. Again, 10,000 kids. Imagine if your kid went to school and never came home, you know, <laughs> uh, they spent terrible. the night it's in terrible. schools. Yeah. Uh, 25,000 altogether between school buses, stuck in in either school buses or in schools overnight. It was just unbelievable. Uh, And and similar situations down in uh, Alabama. Here from uh, Homewood, Alabama, one teacher. This is what we do. This is how we live. This is who we are. Uh, Educators are very... uh, uh, just wonderful people to work with. And, you know, we salute our teachers this morning. Imagine the, the, the teachers are not there to keep the kids overnight. You know what I mean? Right. But they jumped in, and, I mean, you know, you know we're partially sponsored by the uh, NEA and the AFT, and we salute all of our teachers out there who jumped uh, jumped to the occasion yesterday and took care of these kids and spent the night with them in schools. My Aunt Beth is one of them in Birmingham. She spent the night uh, on Tuesday night, spent the night at school with her students, and it looked like she was going to have to spend last night with them as well. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and just in, in fact, in in Homewood, middle school or what was it? Uh, she's fifth grade. Fifth grade. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness! Yeah, Do we have fifth graders. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you got up to uh, a- Atlanta, and there are some there are wonderful stories about people who live near the freeways just went out and and you know did what they could. Right, I saw one couple. They were pushing their baby in a stroller, and they were just taking bottles of water from car to car, just giving people water. Giving people uh, candy bars and you know whatever the, whatever they could blankets. Here uh, in Atlanta, a National Guard trooper uh, saying that uh, one thing that they were able to do to help help uh, one one couple out. We actually had a couple out here that had two uh, infants with them, and they had run out of water, so they couldn't make formula. So luckily, we were able to provide some water for them. So that was one of the that was, that was one of the really good ones. You know, you're doing something like that. Governor uh, Nathan Deal in Atlanta telling us about uh, all the kids who were stranded and how they were able to take care of them finally. This morning, there are no children on buses, and there are about 2,000 of the Fulton County School System's children that are still in their schools. Yeah, so they got most of home, a uh, total of 10,000 I saw spent the night last night. Now. The, you know, the question is, and here's a question. First of all, I'd love to know how you're doing, how you're, how you're weathering this stuff, uh, particularly if you're in the Atlanta, the Birmingham, uh, Alabama, Georgia, uh, coming from those great states down there, uh, let us know. Or if you are in Snowland, where we're used to it, um, Minneapolis and, and Milwaukee and St. Paul and Chicago and all those points in the in the Midwest or in the Northeast, uh, let us know how you're dealing and how how the authorities are dealing with this uh, these conditions. Eight six six fifty five press. But also, um, when you get to um, uh, down in Georgia, the question in Atlanta is: How the hell did this happen? How could this happen? Two years ago, they had a storm that basically shut them down. Uh, how did they? Uh, no, no. Y- you got to admit. 
uh, Peter, states, the southern states are not as equipped because this doesn't happen all that often. No, so it doesn't. To a certain extent, you got to say, all right, you can't expect them to be as ready as Chicago is for a big ice storm. I mean, but well, still, they right. made a pretty dumb mistake in Atlanta. Uh, and let, let's hear the mayor first. The mayor admitted, here's what they did wrong. If there were one major lesson learned in the middle of this challenge, that would be that we need to stagger um, closings for private sector companies, for government, and for the school system. Instead, they let everybody off at the same time, and then the road iced up, and they're yeah. all out there, yeah. and boom. This so, is also one of these situations where I, I don't think I, I, I don't think that even staggering would have helped that much because because of the road conditions. The road conditions are just too bad for even one car to be out there. You cannot mm-hmm. drive on a sheet of ice. It's just not possible because here in D.C. and in Chicago and in Minneapolis and other uh, cities that are used to this, they know you got to salt the roads ahead of time. That helps to keep it from icing over. You got to stay on top of that. You have to use the plows. And in states like Alabama. And Georgia, they have a snow operation, but it ain't that big. Yeah. And so what happened in, in, in Birmingham and in Alabama, they thought that the storm was going to hit somewhere else, so they sent a lot of their resources to where they thought the storm was going to hit. And then yeah. you can't predict the weather. So when the weather changed and the storm sort of hit in other areas, they weren't ready for it at all. They weren't prepared for it at all because they don't have the resources to have a snow team in every city. Yeah. So who who do you blame or can you blame anybody? I guess is a big question. And how are you dealing with it? 866-55-PRESS. Let's talk about it right here this morning. Weather, weather, weather. What are we going to do about it? Grin and bear it, I guess. <laughs> this is the Bill Press Show. single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. That single ember can ignite and destroy your home or even your community. You can't control where that ember will land, only what happens when it does. Get Fire Adapted now at fireadapted.org. Columbine. Virginia Tech. Tucson. Aurora. Fort Hood. Oak Creek. Newtown. 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 How many more? How many more? How many more colleges? How many more classrooms? How many more movie theaters? How many more houses of faith? How many more shopping malls? How many more street corners? How many more? How many more? Enough. 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 Demand a plan. Right now. As a mom. As a dad. As a friend. As a husband. As a wife. As an American. As an American. As an American. As a human being. For the children of Sandy Hook. Demand a plan. No more lists of names. It's not too soon. It's too late. Now is the time. Before we all know someone who loved someone on that list. No more lists. No more. Who they might have been. No more. If we had just done something yesterday. It's time. We can do better than this. We can do better than this. It's time. It's time. It's time for our leaders to act. Demand a plan. Right now. Right now. You! Demand it! Enough. 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 None of us would want to be told we can't marry the person we love. As Americans, we believe in freedom. That's what I fought for as a Marine, and that's what we believe in as Republicans. Freedom means freedom for everyone. I didn't used to understand the importance of same-sex marriage. 
But after learning my brother was gay, I wanted the same rights for him. He was the best man at my wedding, and I want to be the best man at his. It's only fair that Calvin should have the freedom to marry the person he loves, too. It's time for marriage. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket. And it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them. But, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. This is the Bill Press Show. All right, already 27 minutes after the hour on this uh, incredible weather. 866-55-PRESS is the toll-free number. Peter, comment? Uh, Yeah, on Twitter, at BP Show, at BP Show, we have uh, one quick comment saying that uh, this is uh, could just be Mother Nature giving red states a slap upside the head over climate change deniers in their states. So (laughs) that's one way to look at it. Politics, politics, politics Always, never yeah. goes away, does it? Melvin is in South Bend, Indiana, uh, also uh, a place that knows how to handle some pretty severe weather. Hello, yeah. Melvin. Good morning. Well, good morning, sir. And yes, we know how to handle the weather. In fact, we do believe the weathermen, <laughs> unlike the governor in Georgia. Yeah. The guy, well, I think that they predicted a storm, but not to hit Atlanta. I right? think they believe the weatherman a little too much. They oh, put... Well. <laughs> they, they put too much stock in what he said and then didn't have a backup plan. Well, that's the problem. And then the other slap that, that should be added to this is they have always accused the wrath of God on every other part of the country that believe in the constitutional rights of our gay and our lesbian yes. brothers and sisters. Yes. So now they just got slapped. So Melvin, what you're... message that is. Yes, good point. Maybe God punished them. We we'll Pat Robertson this about that. This is the Bill <laughs> Press Show. This is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. She's gonna love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you go. Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. The thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. We've been talking about uh, the severe weather conditions and the unusual weather conditions, particularly in the South, and how some people have dealt with it. Uh, before we move on, uh, Peter, I just got to tell you. Yeah. So um, when I grew up in a little town in, in Delaware, a great little town called Delaware City, which is about 15 miles south of Wilmington, Delaware, where I went to school, mm -hmm. uh, high school, and one year of middle school. So in the eighth grade, I was um, taking the bus home to Delaware City, which is a about a half an hour bus ride and it started to snow okay. and it started to snow and it was one hell of a blizzard and what took a half an hour it took eight hours oh boy eight hours oh. and uh it was the same thing i mean here we are we're stuck on this bus first of all you really get to know people <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> like it or not uh and uh some people were able to get off because they we got close to their home and people and but nobody had any food or drink, you know. It's just a half an hour ride, right? But one woman, 
One woman had a peach pie she was taking home. Oh. And finally, about halfway there, she, she admitted, and now the bus is about half full now because a lot of people got enough, that she had this peach pie. And, but then nobody had anything to cut the peach pie with except one woman had a nail c- clipper, cutter. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we all decided they sort of sterilized it as best we could, and then she cut that peach <laughs> pie with a nail clipper. <laughs> and we got to within uh, four miles of home, and the bus was going off to a, a ramp to go down on the uh, off the highway to, uh-huh. and went off in a ditch. Oh no! And we're stuck in a ditch. So at that point, we just got out and walked, walked in snow up to our you know what? Jeez! Oh, uh, for about a mile, and then uh, I'll never forget it. There was it was a business there, and there were, at that point, um, there were all kinds of people like waiting to see you know to help out or do right, whatever they could. Right, right. And uh, cars had their headlights on, and there were people standing there like, th- and they were able to get out to that point, and then the road was blocked from then on. And one of that one of those people standing there was my daddy. Really? Yeah, my dad. He was. Oh, um, that's so sweet. Yeah, he, he had come out and just one of. Oh, that's for me to come out of that blizzard. Yeah. Oh my Fine, goodness. Though. Yeah, but it was a pretty. From uh, so did you show I, up and say, "Does anybody have a good pie plate or something? <laughs> we got beef pie here." Oh, we had finished that beef pie, baby. But I, <laughs> yeah, oh no, exactly. we finished that beef. But I just when I heard, saw those people stuck in overnight. I mean, we weren't overnight, but I had just a little experience like that. Yeah. So and scary. I remember he took me home and gave me a shot of blackberry brandy. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> to <laughs> wash right down up. the peach warm, pie, of warm course. You up. <laughs> warm me right up. We have time for one quick call Let's before we go. Yeah. Uh, hey, Steve is in uh, Perrysville, Indiana. <laughs> Hello, Steve. Hello, Bill. What's got? Uh, what's up? You can blame all this stuff on the uh, climate change deniers for years that they've denied that we have this problem. And uh, they're the ones, you know, just like the oil companies, they're they're gouging people now because they're saying that they're low on propane and stuff. Yes. Uh, the price of propane around here is six dollars a gallon, and that's not right. I was going to say, what is it normally, Steve? Uh, well, I'm I'm on a contract. I pay a dollar seventy-seven. Oh, whoa, whoa. Yeah, but you know they've ja- they've jacked the prices up to take advantage of people in this in this time. And Steve, you're absolutely right because the climate deniers they come up with this thing. Oh, look how cold it is! So there can't be any global warming. It drives me crazy. Dri- drives, it drives me, me crazy. absolutely nuts, Steve. You're you're so right. Hey, there's one other thing going on which we got to talk about. Appreciate your calls on the weather, and that is um, here we go again. One more member of Congress getting in trouble, but this time it's not over a sex scandal. It's over a little, maybe what we might call an anger management uh, issue with uh, Congressman Michael Grimm from Staten Island. He um, was uh, approached by a reporter right after the uh, State of the Union, and it's a madhouse down there. I've done this, where you stand around and the members come out and you, and you grab them and try to get a comment on what the president said. And these members of Congress and the senators, they are so eager. I, I, I'll never forget the one time that I was in the Statuary Hall um, to get interviews for our show, yeah. right after yes. we start our show. It is, and I, I'm waiting for the speech to be over. Uh-uh, no. About halfway through the speech, people start, <laughs> members and senators start coming out. Right. They haven't even heard the whole damn speech yet, and they're already out there giving Yeah, but they got something to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. Giving their interviews, right? Maybe did the speed read of the speech or something, because they don't want to have to wait until the speech is over, God forbid. So this guy, Michael Grimm, he comes out, and a reporter, Michael Scotto, from uh, News One in New York, who regularly covers him, he was in town for the speech and to get a comment, and he asked the uh, he uh, asked his comment on the State of the Union, and then he asked him a question about the fact that this man, Michael Grimm, is under criminal investigation for some alleged campaign violations, and he asked him sort of how he was dealing with that. Here's uh, how that came down. Some I'm of not the- speaking about anything that's off topic. This is only about the president. Well, what about? So thank you. I- Let me be clear to you. You have to do that to me again. I'll tell you. What. You're not me. Well, uh, it's hard to hear there. I'll try and say it for you. So when he asked him about the criminal investigation, you can't say all of it. Michael Grimm walks away, and then he comes back, and he says, "Let me be clear to you. 
you ever do that to me again, I'll throw you off this effing balcony. Uh, and then he walked away. And then he came back again because the reporter said, that's a legitimate question. And then he comes back again and he said, no, no, no. This is the congressman speaking. No, no, no. You're not man enough. You're not man enough. I'll break you in half like a boy. <laughs> what does like that a boy. even mean? And throw him off the and, and threatens to throw him off the balcony. Now, the first yesterday, at first, <laughs> right? Uh, Michael Grimm said, "Apologize? Hell no! I'm not going to apologize." He said, I was extremely annoyed because I was doing them a favor by rushing to do their interview. I expect a certain level of professionalism and respect from oh. reporters, especially when I'm doing them a favor. Yeah. Yeah. That was, so he said, hell no, I'm not going to apologize. That was his first thing. And then I think he got a call maybe from John Boehner. Yeah. Or from some of the people who said, wait, you idiot, get out there and... Apologize. So he did come out later in the day yesterday and said, um, well, he was just out of control. It was in such a hurry, and they knew that. So to ask when we already said we're just going to do State of the Union was, I felt, inappropriate. But you know what? The bottom line is I overreacted, and, and my emotions got the better of me. I lost my cool, and that shouldn't happen. So that's why I apologize. Yeah. He, the, he comes off like a real jerk. He comes off like a real which he is. Yeah. He's a total colossal jerk. Uh, hey, out in Monterey, California, one of the most beautiful parts of the country. Hello, Ronald. How are you? Hi, Bill. Good morning. Uh, I want to alert everybody. The operating thing is that this congressman is an ex-FBI guy. And yes. The FBI, yes. The yes. FBI is very arrogant, and I don't know if people know if the FBI even has a secret budget. And they're, the FBI is getting very uh, trigger-happy. Even ex-FBI guys are very trigger-happy. So I just want to call up attention to that aspect of this. No, I'm glad you did. Yeah. Uh, he I also is, wonder how I, a guy like that gets through the FBI that so clearly will fly off the handle that fast. You would think that he had learned to, would have learned to deal maybe right? with some of his issues. Yeah. Ronald, I, I got to tell you, I appreciate that comment. And uh, it's good to hear from you from uh, Monterey. Uh, and you were lucky to have uh, Congressman Sam Farr representing you in uh, Monterey. Uh, one of my best friends for a long time, and um, he's got the most beautiful district in the world. From Santa Cruz, California, down the coast, Monterey, Carmel, and all of Big Sur, all the way down to Hearst uh, Castle. Yeah, that sounds pretty nice. Let me tell you, you just motor up and down that district, and <laughs> you are happy as a clam. Uh, final comment on uh, Michael Grimm. It has been reported this morning. We haven't been able to confirm that... Uh, John Boehner has offered him the position of a Republican House whip, <laughs> uh, replacing Eric Cantor. Uh, he certainly would be qualified for that to be the, yeah, the, new, exactly. whoa, the new whip. Uh, and it's also be reported, uh, uh, also unconfirmed yet, that Chris Christie has called him and offered him the job as the new chair of the New Jersey Port Authority. <laughs> because... He's certainly made out of the same cut from the same cloth <laughs> as Chris Christie. We'll be back with George Zornick from The Nation magazine. This is The Bill Press Show. It is possible to read the history of this country as one long struggle to extend the liberties established in our Constitution to everyone in America. In other words, who, according to our laws and culture, gets to be considered a person? The law creates legal personhood, and movements create law and change culture. So how have the courts passed laws to shape our culture? That history goes way back before Citizens United. 1819, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, Supreme Court case, turned a corporate charter from a government-granted charter to a contract. This ruling gave corporations standing within the Constitution. 1886, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. Though the court did not rule on corporate personhood, the decision was subsequently cited as a precedent to hold that a private corporation is entitled to the same 14th Amendment rights of due process and equal protection as human beings. 
This makes it impossible for us to make laws that treat local businesses any differently than giant multinational corporations, even if their business practices are deemed to be harmful to workers, the environment and communities, or if they have a history of violating the law. Hale v. Henkel, 1906. The court granted corporations the Fourth Amendment search and seizure protection. Dodge v. Ford Motor Company, 1919. The Michigan Supreme Court says, the business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stockholders. Stockholder primacy is established. The purpose of the corporation, according to the court, is no longer to serve the public good, as it had been. It is now to maximize profit for shareholders above all else. Pennsylvania Coal Company v. Mahon, 1922. Corporations get the Fifth Amendment takings clause, meaning if you pass a regulation that impacts a corporation's ability to make a profit, that is deemed a taking, and they can sue for the right to future profits lost. This creates a chilling effect, and local and state governments become much more hesitant to pass laws in the public interest for fear that corporations can claim loss of potential profits that cities and states will be on the hook to pay. Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976. The Supreme Court rules that spending money to influence elections is protected under the First Amendment, in effect saying that money is speech. Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission, 2010. Today, the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Roberts declared that because of the alchemy of its 19th century predecessors in deciding that corporations had all the rights of people any restrictions on how these corporate beings spend their money on political advertising are unconstitutional. The court's ruling threatens to undermine the integrity of elected institutions across the nation. It's a rejection of the common sense of the American people. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. Here we go, 12 minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, As a proud liberal and progressive, I have told you many times, my Bible is The Nation magazine and has been for a long time. Can't get a uh, better progressive take on uh, the news of the day. And the nation not afraid to prod President Obama when they don't think he is going far enough on our progressive agenda. George Zornick covers uh, Washington for the nation, and he joins us on our news line this morning. Hey, George. Good morning again. Hey, good morning, Bill. So uh, from a progressive uh, yardstick, if you will, how well did the president do in the State of the Union? Anything there for progressives to cheer about? Yeah, I think in the individual there was a lot of good stuff um, that people really were excited about and that people had been pushing for, frankly. You know, the, the big kind of headline, at least in my opinion, was that not only did Obama push for a national minimum wage of ten ten an hour, but... He issued an, uh, that executive order, which will guarantee uh, future federal contract workers right. um, that they will be able to earn that wage. And that was something that a lot of progressives really didn't think he was going to do, that the White House had repeatedly said he probably wouldn't do. Um, so for him to announce it in the speech, I think, gave a, gave a nice boost. Um, and I think in general, you know, you can go down the list of things that he talked about, whether it was immigration or, or climate change or... Um, so on that I, that I that or income inequality that I think um, were really good. I, I think though, if you step back and look at the speech um, sort of as a theme, I think some progressives were disappointed were disappointed that he didn't really kind of go big on a the theme of income inequality. You know, the president sort of didn't even really want to say the words. He instead used the term "ladders of opportunity." I was going to say um, I don't remember. We were talking about this yesterday. I don't remember here. Here, are you still there, George? Yeah. 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 All right. So it's just a click in the phone. Right. I thought we lost you. Um, I don't remember hearing him I- issue the phrase or, or utter the words income inequality, did he? No, he didn't. It's a strategic shift by the White House for some reason. Um, 
not to talk about it in, in direct, stark terms like that, although they have certainly in the past, uh, most notably in his yeah. December 4th speech, where he right. really went big on it. And what was weird about that is that, you know, from Obama down to many Democrats have been talking about income inequality so relentlessly that you've actually seen Republicans get scared enough yes. that they start talking about it. And now you see Mike Lee and Marco Rubio and all these guys. So right. finally they have what seems to be a winning hand. And at the last minute, for whatever reason, he, he kind of took his foot off the gas and, and wanted to talk about ladders of opportunity instead. So I think that was confusing to a lot of progressives. One of the things I, I know some people were disappointed in is that in terms of executive orders, one executive order that members of the LGBT community have been pushing for a long time is to do something in terms of employment, non -dis ending discrimination in the workplace for uh, LGBT uh, people. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that legislation is bottled up in the Congress. And so uh, every, almost every day at the briefing, the question comes up, why, don't you, why doesn't he do an executive order, for at least for federal contractors? Uh, and the president didn't mention it at all in the State of the Union. No end, uh, no, no, no conversation about it. No end at all. Yeah, he didn't even he didn't even prod Congress to get it done, and I think a lot of people were disappointed by that. And they say, "Well, look, if if this is supposed to be the year of action, yeah. which was the big buzzword that we're going to get stuff done," and Edna is is just just barely bottled up in the Congress. I mean, if people wanted to accuse him of abusing his power for issuing that order, what what he could say is that look, end up pass the Senate, even with the, the Republican filibuster, end up pass the Senate. And in the House of Representatives, the votes are there. They, they have over 200 co-signers, including some Republicans, who have signed a letter saying that, or, or either co-sponsored the bill or signed a letter saying they'll vote for it. So the votes are there in the House, too. It's just that Boehner won't bring it to the floor. Mm -hmm. So it's passed the Senate, can pass the House. There's really no reason not to just say, okay, fine, I'm just going to issue the order then if All you're right. not going to so, get it done. In terms of a year of action, what kind of follow-up uh, can we expect to see from uh, the president on this agenda? Well, you know, he was all around the country yesterday talking about the um, starter savings retirement accounts that he's going to initiate, and that will happen relatively soon within the next few months. Um, obviously, the, the minimum wage order will go into effect. You know, a lot of the rest of it has other big sort of executive action on, on jobs is to hold a summit, a job summit in the spring, which may be fine, but it's not yeah. really going to change anyone's life. So, you know, it's funny, though, the bulk of what he's going to do executively is stuff that he didn't really talk about, and that will be on climate change. He mentioned climate change, but he didn't really outline the executive orders that he's going to take. I do think he's going to take them, and I do think that will be the most substantial sort of action that comes from the White House this year. I think he just, for whatever reason, didn't want to, and it may be a smart idea, mm -hmm. not to throw the kitchen sink of all the executive orders at Congress right. at once in that speech and just sort of do it without really you know, hyping it up and, and politicizing it. Uh, and speaking of energy and climate change, another disappointment to it that we've heard a lot is uh, nothing on the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, and I guess you couldn't expect him to make that announcement in the State of the Union, but uh, it would have been nice <laughs> if he had said, no, yeah. no way, no how, right? It doesn't fit. But. Yeah, I mean, I guess in, in in some ways you could say, well, no news is good news. He didn't yeah, say, right. he didn't signal, well, I really think pipelines are important or some kind of clue that like, hey, get ready for an approval. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And, and there's certainly when he doesn't mention things that can't be good. You know, a lot of progressives are very um, anxious about this Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that was something oh, that he yeah. very notably didn't mention by name. He, he right. had one throwaway line to opening up new markets to export. Yeah. But when you think about all the corporate lobbyists of all different stripes who were no doubt begging the White House to put a mention of this trade right. deal into the State of the Union, the fact that they didn't get it is, is encouraging to some progressives. Yeah, I was a little nervous about that one, too. Uh, well, George, it's, uh, it'll be fun to watch and see how this whole thing uh, plays out. Uh, and thanks for your time this morning. Always good to talk to you. Thanks, George. Thanks, Bill. Nice time. George Zarnick. Uh, DC reporter for The Nation, thenation.com. This is The Bill Press Show. This is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the She's going to love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you go. Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself.
feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. All right, I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay, so who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect, that's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. Thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. is the Bill Press Show. Here we go. Uh, in the next top of the next hour, Leo Gerard, president of the Steelworkers. Quick story I want to sneak in. From North Dakota, a man by the name of Rodney Brassart is going to go to jail because he stole six of his neighbor's cows and went on the run. And you know how they found him? Well, if you're walking around with six cows. In North Dakota, you can yeah. blend in pretty oh. easily that way. But they found him using a predator Drone. He is the first American arrested by using drones. He's a rustler. Don't He's they call him a, a rustler, right? Yeah, that's it. Man, I don't know there are any rustlers left. We'll get those <laughs> rustlers. We're bringing our yeah, drones. Bring in the drones. I'd rather have them in North Dakota than in Pakistan. That's right. All right. There we go. This is the Bill Press Show. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning on a Thursday, January 30. Great to see you today and welcome. 
Welcome to the Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live from uh, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, and our studio on Capitol Hill right down the street from the United States Capitol Building here in the shadow of the dome where President Obama gave his big State of the Union speech, number five, on Tuesday night. And yesterday he was out on the road carrying his message around the country. His first stop, a Costco up in Latham, Maryland, uh, about 15 miles up the road, where Costco pays its employees a minimum of 11 bucks an hour. And the president talking about the need to raise a minimum wage and telling workers there, nobody who works for a job full time should have to live in poverty in this country. And then he was off to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, nearby, visiting a steel plant, uh, a great union plant by the uh, United Steel Workers. Their president, Leo Gerard, was there at the plant with him yesterday. The president talking about bringing jobs back to America today. He'll visit a General Electric's plant in Milwaukee and then a high school down in Nashville, Tennessee, again with that same message of equal opportunity and doing something to remedy the problem of income inequality in this country. The House also passed a farm bill before it uh, left town again. But the big news, of course, is the weather, and the biggest weather news is coming from places that just are not used to cold weather snow and ice, uh, particularly in Atlanta and Birmingham. Thousands of people spending the night in their cars, in supermarkets, in restaurants, in strangers' homes. And they finally, it looks like, have the roads cleared. Lots coming up right here on Free Speech TV and Talker TV. This is the Bill Press Show. Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look! Your crush is looking at you. Poor you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. No one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit stopbullying.gov. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making home affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we have pep talkers standing by to get you motivated for your GED diploma. Text the name Terry to 69222 for a sympathetic pep talk. You show people what you really are. Or for a gentle pep talk, text the name Deborah. You know you're going to make people very proud of you. And if that's not enough, text the name Danny for an extreme pep talk. Prove everyone wrong. Show them you're the boss. Get your GED pep talk and find free GED classes. Text the name of the person you want a pep talk from to 69222. Did you see the world differently? Did you celebrate the victory? So today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Did you stand up against our greatest threat?
Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. President Obama on the road again today out to Milwaukee and then down to Nashville taking his message of a uh, progressive agenda and a year of action out to the American people. Good morning, everybody. What do you say? It's nice to see you today. Welcome, welcome here to the Bill Press Show on uh, Thursday morning, January 30. Good to have you with us. We're coming to you live all across this great country of ours, coast to coast, from our studio right here on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., Uh, bringing you the news of the day here in our nation's capital, what's going on here around the country and around the globe. Uh, You can, uh, again, uh, not just hear us on your local progressive talk radio station. You can watch us on Free Speech TV. If you've got a satellite dish, just go to DirecTV. And you can watch us on your iPad or your iPhone or your computer on our video stream at TalkerTV, youtube.com slash TalkerTV. Uh, good to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us. And uh, join me in saying hello to our team this morning, Peter Ogburn and uh, Alisa Murphy. Hello, hey, guys. Hey. Good morning. Happy Alicia Thursday. Cruz is here with uh, the phones covered to take your calls at 866-55-PRESS. And uh, Cyprian Bolding has got the cameras on, got the lights on, keeping us looking good on the uh, video stream and on Free Speech TV. Uh, again, the president on the road today. Uh, yesterday, uh, the first day of his road trip, he started out at a Costco up in Lanham, Maryland, just about 15 miles up the road, and he discovered what I discovered the first time I went to a Costco, which is what I, uh, I love about going to a Costco. First of all, they treat their people right. They pay their employees more than a living wage, about $11 an hour is where they start at Costco. Uh, they know they get better people and happier people, and people are going to stay there longer. You know, if they if you pay them a decent salary, living wage. But that uh, the other thing you love about Costco is you can buy <laughs> anything and a lot of it, a- and a lot of it. Yeah. Okay, I'm amazed. You can buy a house at Costco. <laughs> uh, the president here's the president. He was just blown away. You can buy a sofa, a chocolate chip cookies, and a snorkel set all in the same. Absolutely. And, yeah. not, and not just chocolate chip cookies. A giant tub oh. of chocolate chip cookies. Oh, yeah. If you need to get 2,000 no, Q-tips, no, nothing comes small. you go to uh, Costco. No, nothing and you always need 2,000 Q-tips. Why not? Well, you, you know, you get a year's supply. If you need 50 croissants, uh, you go to Costco. I... I, I been there now many times. I'm just blown away by what you can it's get crazy. there. Then he went on. He went on from um, uh, from Costco uh, in uh, in Maryland here to a steel plant out in West Mifflin, Pennsylvania, and the president opened up, introducing some of the uh, friends who were there, and he said, "Quote." And then we've got one of my good buddies who is always in my ear about working people, and I love this guy. The international president of the United Steelworkers, Leo Gerard, is here. I love him, too. And he's here with us this morning. Hello, President Gerard. Good morning, sir. <laughs> How you doing? Hi, Leo. <laughs> Hi, folks. I'm doing all right. <laughs> That's a hell of an introduction. That is. Yeah, that, that was that was very kind of him. That was very nice. Yeah. I think he was. I think that was his way of telling me to get off his back. <laughs> <laughs> I love you said you're always in his ear. Hey, you're always in my ear too. But you know, that's, that's your job, right? That's right. Tell us about this plan, first of all. Why was it important that the president go there? Well, this is a, a very sophisticated uh, plant that uh, is part of what, what uh, is called the Mon Valley operations. There are several plants in, in the valley from up the rivers from Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. And uh, Irvin Works makes a coal roll steel that can be used for appliances, can be used in automobiles. And just up the river from that little few miles at uh, McKeesport, they make a transmission pipe for water, for oil, for gas. And uh, then not far from that, that steel is also used for what's called oil country tubular goods. So they make the full range of products. And But people that have never been in a steel mill, a modern steel mill, don't understand. The raw material goes in at one end, uh, chemically designed in, with, with uh, a lot of science. 
it comes out at the other end, which might be three quarters of a mile down mm. from the hot end to the finishing end, rolled cold within one ten thousandth of an inch of deviance or perfect. Wow. wow. And never touched by human hands, all computer controlled, Is all that- equipment that's maintained and, and run by our members. And it's a sophisticated operation. It's like going to NASA. You know, uh, <laughs> wow. You know, it, it, my image of a steel plant, right, is, and I've been to one in Southern California, there were these great big huge furnaces and burners, and you see all these flames, and, you know, and the, I guess it's not that way anymore, right? Well, it's, 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 that's, that's where you melt and make, make the, the, the steel itself. But every, every uh, what, what we call every round of steel, is chemically designed. It's designed uh, to so much of uh, whatever the inputs are, so it comes out with a specific degree of, of hardness, a specific degree of softness, a specific degree of size, width, thickness, and it's all done uh, very scientifically. You got to melt it. You got to make it. Yeah. But from, but from putting in the raw material that end to coming out three quarters of a mile down a strip at the other end, never touched by human hands. All ca- you know, all designed. That's amazing. And, and in, in in the modern steel industry today in America, there's two really good points to make. It's the most productive steel industry in the world, and uh, by measured by man hours per ton. Workers can make a ton of steel of any quality within less than two man hours per ton. Whoa. And then on top of that, um, 95% of the products made in the steel industry, meaning the different grades and kinds of steel, didn't exist 10 years ago. That's how much R&D and science has gone into this. Now, are these all these are all union union plants, correct? These are all steelworker represented right. plants, that's right. Good for you. Yeah, and good for good for all of our good brothers and sisters working there. The president came with a very strong message to West Midland, Pennsylvania, uh, echoing what he had said the night before in the state of the union. Leo, uh, let's listen up very quickly here. Nobody who works full time should ever have to raise a family in poverty. If you're doing your responsibilities and working hard, then you should be able to pay the rent. Makes sense, right? The minimum wage? Absolutely. And uh, I, th- I think that uh, through the State of the Union and what he said and uh, the commitments he made to have the contractors that are working for the government mm-hmm. uh, pay the $10.10 an hour as the minimum wage that they'll pay if they're going to get a contract from the federal government, I think that's a good step in the right direction. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to, uh, to to leave it at $10.10. I mean, it, 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 the $10.10 doesn't yet bring the minimum wage to where it would have been if it had been t- tagged to inflation, but it comes close. But the reality is this, even at $10.10, uh, you're not going to have, <clears throat> it's a hell of a lot better than it is now. But you're not going to have the kind of standard of living that allows you to not, uh, to you know, to sort of live on the high end in New York City, <laughs> right? Or or Pittsburgh, or, or even you know, like put anything aside, right? Barely That's be able right. to make it through. I think it may lift you above the poverty line, but but barely. I mean, I haven't done yeah. the math quickly, but I, I remember seeing the. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. The recommended budget that uh, McDonald's and Visa put out a couple of months ago. And how how people on minimum wage could survive, they had them working two jobs, <laughs> and even at two jobs, there was no money for health care and no money for food. You sh- I guess they meant you should eat McDonald's or Visa cards. I'm not sure. The, pre- the president, yeah, I, I no, I mean the idea that anybody could 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 live at seven on seven twenty five an hour is is, is insane. But yeah. let me ask you, the president also talked, and I thought of you uh, Saturday, uh, Tuesday night. He talked about bringing jobs, and you and I have talked about this, bringing jobs, manufacturing jobs, back to America. Is that happening? Is that realistic? Uh, it has. It, 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 it's, it's coming back slowly. I, I, you know, I think that the president made the right point and pointed us in the right direction that we can bring jobs back. One of the things that's helping bring jobs back to America right now is that America is becoming energy, energy efficient, and if we do if we do natural gas in an environmentally sound way, if we uh, use the as the president says all of the above methods of generating energy, including renewables and, and a lot of jobs in renewables, mm-hmm. uh, we can have a lower energy cost than 
places like Japan, China, Europe, and, and energy in almost every facility is one of the big costs of production. We've lost, we've lost tens of thousands of jobs in the aluminum sector. And the reason we lost those many jobs is the cost of energy. Energy is one of the biggest components to making aluminum. And well, if we keep the energy cost uh, through, through being self-sufficient and an advantage for America, jobs will come back. But one of the things we need to make sure is that uh, build is that we don't need to have the jobs come back at ten dollars and ten cents yeah, an hour again right you know if if you're working in a manufacturing plant a foundry a steel mill an auto assembly plant uh, if you're working at our cwa call center you're not making ten dollars and ten cents but you can have an opportunity a good life which means we need to grow the labor movement we need to be able to have the right to organize without bosses sticking their nose in and we need to have the right to bargain for a share of the profits we help create or the services we provide. What do you see in terms of the job market around the country? Um, what are we now, so just under 8%, 7.8% unemployment? Yeah. yeah. What, what, from, from what we see, because we're a diverse manufacturing union, is that we have some form of stability. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is we're not having a lot of layoffs, uh -huh. we're not having, not having a lot of plant closures, but the growth but, is very, very slow. Right. And and so what we need, in fact, we talked about it amongst uh, a group of us just earlier in the week. What we need is for the Republicans to get out of the way. If you're not going to help, get the hell out of the way and let the president move his agenda on jobs, let the president move his agenda on infrastructure, let the president move his, his, his agenda on renewable energy. Let's move the country forward. And if they got out of the way, didn't even, if they don't want to help, just get the hell out of the way. And, and if, they did, if we could do that, everybody that I talk to, and that I, I meet with a lot of CEOs of the companies we represent, they actually say that if, that, if we could get the economy going, it would take off like a rocket. Well, you know, I, I, I'm glad you said that because I get the feeling uh, that even the corporate community has sort of had it with these Tea Party Republicans, right? And they're fed up. They're, they're, they're not doing the business community any favor, right, by shutting down the government, right, or, or blocking the minimum wage or blocking uh, a renewal of, of uh, unemployment insurance, right? Yeah, yeah. So and, 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 and maybe worst of all, Bill, worst of all, stopping the modernization, if that's the right word, of America's infrastructure. 60% yes. 60 of the schools in America, I used to say, were more than 50 years old. Now I can say more than 60% of the schools in America are more than 60 years old. Look what's happening with the cold weather. Schools can't have heating and cooling systems that can deal with the weather. Too hot in the summer, kids can't go to school. Too cold in the winter, kids can't go to school. Here in Pittsburgh, we've had uh, water lines break because of the cold. Because uh, the infrastructure, you go, you go to the Washington National Airport, and you got to take a bus out to the damn tarmac because the, the airport can't uh, handle the amount of flights it's got. That's the nation's capital. Make it the showpiece of the country. Yeah. No. So I mean, it, it, the, the bridges, the highways, the, yeah. you know, the transportation systems. I mean, you across the board, and. I, I, it's so clear to me. And if you're not investing in it, and if we're not building, you know, we're just going to get left behind. Let, let me put in a plug for the governor in Illinois. Uh, the governor there called us, and uh, they're having on uh, February the 8th, they're having a ribbon cutting at a bridge that was built between uh, Missouri and Illinois. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the governor, every bit of that's American steel, American product. That was American-built bridge. No built kidding. on time, built yeah. under budget, and, and built American. Put that against what happened in the Bay I, when, they, when they farmed it out to China. I was six years just, behind schedule yep. and $6 billion over budget. Yep, I was just thinking of that when you said it, because, of course, coming from the Bay Area, right? Yeah. yeah the idea yeah. that they built that, I can't believe, that new Bay Bridge. I hope that was Schwarzenegger. Who, uh, 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 and I know it, it was. wasn't Jerry Brown. but it, no, it was Schwarzenegger. Yeah, who outsourced that bridge. Right, uh, the, so, yeah. so so symbolic in the Bay Area, next to the Golden Gate Bridge, the most famous bridge in the world, maybe, and and outsource that to to China. Yeah. yeah, and 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 then you got, like I said, Governor Quinn and Governor Nixon partner together to make that bridge American made. So you look at the Bay, and then you look at that uh, under siege New Jersey governor who 
just a couple of weeks ago or months ago, time goes by, a couple of months yeah. ago, wanted to have a big announcement that he was going to fix a bridge in New Jersey. But guess what? Even he farmed it out to China. Did he really? And that's yeah. not the only bridge problem he had. And talk about infrastructure. Yeah, that's right. He's got another bridge problem. Yeah. But talk about infrastructure. Remember, he's also the one that refused any investment in that in widening rail. the tunnel into uh, into New York City, right? Yeah. Leaving yeah. them and with like a horse and buggy tunnel into that. Yeah, and also the high speed rail stuff. And the high speed he, rail. He and yeah. a bunch of others. So this is the point that I was saying. Yeah. If if right. if the Republicans don't have the yep. wherewithal to take on their Tea Party, then just shut your mouth, go sit in the corner, and get out of the way, and let us move the agenda forward. Get the hell out of the way. There's a yeah. message from uh, President Leo Gerard, President of the United Steelworkers, and a proud sponsor of the Bill Press Show, for which we are again very, very grateful. And grateful for your time this morning. Glad you had a good Thank time you. with the with the uh, with the big guy <laughs> yesterday. All right. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. Yeah, thank Talk you. Talk to you again Take soon. Take care. Bye bye. All right, man. The great Leo Gerard. You can find out more about their good work, of course, at usw.org. Preston gave him a hell of a shout out. That's a hell of a shout out. A hell of a shout I mean, out. That's that's pretty good. Yeah. I'll I'll take love that. It. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV. This is the Bill Press Show. A single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. That single ember can ignite and destroy your home or even your community. You can't control where that ember will land, only what happens when it does. Get Fire Adapted now at fireadapted.org. Columbine. Virginia Tech. Tucson. Aurora. Fort Hood. Oak Creek. Newtown. 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 How many more? How many more? How many more colleges? How many more classrooms? How many more movie theaters? How many more houses of faith? How many more shopping malls? How many more street corners? How many more? How many more? Enough. 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 Demand a plan. Right now. As a mom. As a dad. As a friend. As a husband. As a wife. As an American. As an American. As an American. As a human being. For the children of Sandy Hook. Demand a plan. No more lists of names. It's not too soon. It's too late. Now is the time. Before we all know someone who loved someone on that list. No more lists. No more. Who they might have been. No more. If we had just done something yesterday. It's time. We can do better than this. We can do better than this. It's time. It's time. It's time for our leaders to act. Demand a plan. Right now. Right now. You! Demand it! Enough! Enough. 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 None of us would want to be told we can't marry the person we love. As Americans, we believe in freedom. That's what I fought for as a Marine, and that's what we believe in as Republicans. Freedom means freedom for everyone. I didn't used to understand the importance of same-sex marriage, but after learning my brother was gay, I wanted the same rights for him. He was the best man at my wedding, and I want to be the best man at his. It's only fair that Calvin should have the freedom to marry the person he loves, too. It's time for marriage. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. 
So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. This is the Bill Press Show. <laughs> I was still laughing about President Obama at Costco yesterday. You buy a sofa? <laughs> you buy a chocolate chip cookie and you can buy a scuba diving. Scuba diving. Or whatever. Or a <laughs> snorkeling set. Or yeah. Was. Anyhow. 27 minutes uh, after the hour. We're going to talk about some of the problems with federal prisons uh, coming up next uh, with the former president of the Prisons Bureau Council of the AFGE. Peter. Quick comment off of uh, our conversation with President Leo Girard there. Uh, NC Nomad says, I really don't understand why the House will not pass a jobs bill. We have a crumbling infrastructure. People very upset and, and spirited on Twitter where we're tweeting at BP Show. Yeah, I know so why they won't pass it, because President Obama's for it. Yeah, yeah. They, don't, they don't care what's good for the country. It's, is Obama for it or against it? Right. Yeah, that's all they care about. Uh, update, by the way, you're going to be very happy to hear. We I'm talked happy. about Michael Grimm, the congressman oh, who verbally right. assaulted that reporter and said he was going to throw him over the balcony. He's getting some help. Uh, this morning in the New York Daily News, an op-ed by Anthony Weiner. Oh, no. Headline, <laughs> Anthony Weiner's advice to Congressman Michael Grimm on how to get along with reporters. And Anthony Weiner has written an op-ed that t- that says he knows the reporter for New York One and he knows Michael Grimm and he likes them both very much. And he gives him some advice on that, why you should be nice to reporters and has a whole piece there. We'll tweet out that link at BP Show on Twitter. Tell me it has nothing to do with selfies. <laughs> I was going to say, I know one thing you can send to a reporter that would make them happy. <laughs> if, nothing else, if, if nothing else, it'll get them a story. Oh, my God. Well, with Anthony Weiner, this, when you need advice and help from Anthony Weiner, you are in big trouble. Yeah. If you're a member of Congress, is all i got to say. This is the Bill Press Show. This is my computer. This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Click it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. She's gonna love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you go. Here we go. (laughs) Good job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. All right. I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay. So who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect. That's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who to call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. And listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. The thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Yeah. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. On your radio, on TV, and online, this is The Bill Press Show. You got it. 33 minutes after the hour now. Thursday morning, January 30. Great to see you this Thursday. Thank you for joining us. We are coming to you live from uh, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., our studio on Capitol Hill. Brought to you today by uh, the National Education Association of Good Men and Women of the NEA under President Dennis Van Roekel doing a great job in the classrooms of America and we want to especially, um, we thank them for their support, and especially salute our teachers uh, in many, many states uh, and all the extra great work that they have done the last few days dealing with kids who have been uh, trapped in their schools or in their school buses uh, in, this, in this bad weather. Uh, the teachers have really risen to the occasion. And uh, Atlanta alone, 10,000 kids spending the night in the schools uh, last night, and you know, uh, the teachers were the ones who were who were taking uh, good care of them. Uh, speaking of uh, our good union brothers and sisters, we're uh, proud to welcome uh, another uh, good union brother to the studio this morning. You may remember uh, a couple of weeks ago we visited with uh, J. David Cox, who is president of AFGE, uh, Federal Government Employees. One of the important parts of that union are those cor- are correctional officers. Uh, they call themselves the Prisons Bureau Council. Uh, their former president, Phil Glover, joining us in studio this morning. Hi, Phil. Good to see you. Morning, Bill. Down from Pennsylvania. You guys weathering the, uh, s- the c- snow and ice up there? Actually, it's a lot better here than it is there, that's for sure. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. We have about 14 inches when I left of <laughs> snow at my house, so oh, this, this was a break. <laughs> hey, we got by with... With an inch, I think, yeah. uh, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, let me let me ask you about the the the, the work and the conditions in these uh, federal prisons. You hear a lot of stories about problems with prisons. Today. So you you and your members rep- are the correctional officers in federal prisons alone, right? Correct. How many are there? Uh, there's there's about 114 federal prisons uh, in in 37 states. Whoa. Right, so you go, you're coast to coast, right? Big, big outfit. These include the the real heavy security, maximum security prisons, right? Yeah, we have about eighteen uh, high security penitentiaries across the country. Anybody ever escaped from any of them? Uh, probably not the high security facilities. Uh, not since probably Alcatraz uh, <laughs> way back in the '60s. <laughs> oh, look, it made uh, a great movie. That did, it yeah. did. But uh, no, uh, we've been uh-huh. very fortunate to uh, not have escapes at the high security facilities. Yeah. I I have to uh, I have to give a plug to my friend Richard Tuggle, one of my best friends in Los Angeles, who wrote Escape from Alcatraz. Is that right? Yeah. No kidding. So uh, uh, I always think of that. Uh, but uh, the reason I ask about the prison is because all this talk about 
And the president said the other night, again, we have to close down, shut down Guantanamo. And some Republicans say, well, we can't bring them here because, you know, there's, we don't have any place that can hold them. Uh, we, we, have, we have some pretty tough characters in our federal prisons. Uh, we have over, uh, we have well over, uh, I think, 300 uh, terrorist-type inmates already in our system. Yeah. Uh, we've held these people for years. Go back to the 93 World Trade Center bombing mm-hmm. uh, when they were prosecuted in New York uh, we have those inmates uh, secured. They've been secured since 1993 uh, in a federal prison. So right. we can handle those inmates. That's not a problem. Now, um, you hear about uh, problems, particularly crowding and underfunding with prisons around the country. Is that is that a problem with the federal prisons as well? It is. What happened in the in the in the uh, early 2000s? Uh, when the administrations changed from Bill Clinton's administration to the Bush administration, all of a sudden our budget started to uh, shrink. And what happened, uh, we used to be staffed around 96% of funding levels, and now we're around 89% of funding levels. And that's continued uh, over over the, the course of these last uh, uh, couple uh, administrations. So is it because so what? Uh, well, first of all, I guess that means is is there overcrowding in terms of too many prisoners in in too few facilities? Absolutely. Our high security prisons, for instance, are fifty one percent overrated capacity. Um, our medium facilities and lows are around forty to forty five percent overrated capacity. Uh, and what kind of problems does that generate or create in a in a prison? Well, anytime, I mean, anytime you take a a, a group of men and put them in a uh, a secure facility, close quarters, it, it develops into problems. And just like here in a city, um, you have groups develop that yeah. that all want they all have competing interests inside the facility for recreation space, for education space, um, and different programs. Oh, I can see so, that could create a lot of tension. It, I mean, it's bad enough. You know, Peter and I are both here and like in the studio. I mean, just this close, pro- <laughs> <laughs> with this close proximity. It is a little tight, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, and imagine 24 hours a day, 24 well, seven. I right? can, I can no, tell I you can't. in a room this size, we may put six inmates in it as well. Get out of here. At some is of that, the low security prisons. Yes. Wow. Is that right? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And you can just, you just imagine the problems that would Great. Right. And in terms of now for what I'm getting to in terms of your side of the equation here, the correctional officers, that creates even more problems for you, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you have to monitor uh, the inmates' conduct. And, and, and look, you know, we get obviously we get hit pretty hard with uh, how we handle federal prisons. And we have a lot of outside groups that criticize what we do. But I can tell you that as a, as a union, we have asked for more funding for building so that we don't have the crowding. Uh, we've asked for, uh, we've, we've supported a bill, S-1410, with Senator Durbin, uh, Senator Leahy, and Senator Lee out of Utah, actually, mm-hmm. who have co-sponsored a bill called the Smart Sentencing Act to try to lower crowding. And some of these other uh, initiatives that the Attorney General has put forward to try to limit how they prosecute those kind of things, we have supported all of that. Well, as the as the prison population has grown, has the number of correctional officers grown? No, uh, as a percentage, no. Uh, that's where we've lost uh, over the years. Uh, instead of keeping pace, we, we've we've been outmatched uh, basically. And what does that mean in terms of your workload? Number one, and your safety. Number two. Well, we've seen increases in assault rates. Uh, we've seen we had an officer murdered last year in uh, Canaan, Pennsylvania. Uh, Eric Williams was murdered by an inmate alone in a housing unit. He was working with 130 high security inmates by himself uh, on an evening shift, and uh, he was so one one person responsible for 130 inmates. Yes, yes, and and actually, at some facilities, that's worse. That's not uh, uh, that's not you know beyond the scope uh, we we've had that for many years that's uh, that's that's a lot of responsibility it is i mean you, you're, not, wow. you're yeah you're not talking third graders or i mean you're talking right i was gonna get at that grown yeah. grown men each of whom are there for a reason and some of them are there because they've been involved in violent crimes yes the high security facilities in particular uh those inmates have been 
normally they're career offenders. They've been in the system for a long time, or they're coming into the system after committing crimes that are pretty violent, uh, mm-hmm. and, and they end up in those situations. And then, again, the facilities break up into gang activity and different things, and you have to deal with that every day. You, I'm fascinated by the, 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 you know, when you talk, when we talk to a lot of people who represent uh, kids and work with children or work with their fellow workers and things like that, but these are, like you said, criminals, and they don't necessarily get a lot of sympathy uh, from people, so it's, it's, it's a really kind of sticky dynamic, I think. It's difficult, and, and trying to cut through the noise is right, difficult. Right, right. Because what happens with us is we're depicted as a bunch of you know, thugs, you know, gorillas basically coming out here beating inmates. I mean, we get this a lot. I'm not, you know, and and I, we really are trying to control the, the situation with the number of inmates that we have, the facilities. We have over um, 40 facilities that are over 50 years of age. And so we have we have places that are falling down around us as we try to maintain it. And then Congress gives us a budget of $90 million a year to do maintenance Hmm. and repair, which is impossible. I mean, you could take that and spend it on two or three uh, prisons. Let's say Lewisburg, for instance, in the middle of Pennsylvania, which is an old facility. Yeah, yeah. So Mm -hmm. we're we're always under the gun on on these kind of things. And are you armed? No. Uh, We carry no firearms inside the facilities. And uh, we do have some perimeter patrol uh, and some towers. But other than that, inside the facilities, we don't. We uh, we have initiated a pepper spray. It, it would be surprising to you that the mall mall cops uh, have pepper spray, and officers inside a federal prison don't. Uh, so we we are just now starting to get that inside federal some federal prisons. Do you have like I, I don't want any state secrets here, but batons? I mean, do you have any? No, any? no. Essentially, we carry a radio, we carry a body alarm, uh, and we carry keys. And our main objective is to communicate with the inmates to make sure we don't have problems. That's our first line is uh, is to try to communicate and not have issues. If we have an incident that occurs in a unit, we're supposed to hit our alarms and have as many staff come to respond as you can. And then we, we deal with the situation. I imagine that anything like a baton or anything like that would escalate a situation very quickly if it got in the wrong hands well you say that but they have broom handles they have mop handles okay. they have chairs mm-hmm. they have i mean they have everything at their disposal to injure you as an officer wow. that they require uh the officer for instance that was murdered last year he was stabbed uh over a hundred times with homemade uh weapons homemade uh, shanks. shanks and they were fashioned out of different pieces of material through mm-hmm. from the prison so for us, we would rather have the risk of having something on us uh, that we can get to than to depend on our uh, f- folks showing up at the right time to help you. Because yeah. that's, that's a problem. Yeah. Why would you take this job? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a darn good question. Think about that uh, one for a second. Uh, you know what? Maybe I, I, I should I'm think feeling, about it. I'm feeling scared just sitting here. No, I think. Uh, well, I mean, this is I, like a scared straight episode. I, you know? I guess in my own my own uh, situation, which is all I could speak about, is I came out of the military. Um, I, I left the 82nd Airborne Division in 1990. Uh, I came home. My wife wanted to come home and not travel around the military. And as I looked for work, I had been an MP, mm-hmm. and I ended up in law enforcement right. uh, in the prison system so it uh, it fit uh, what i had done before well good for you and thank you i just <laughs> don't ask me to take it here. uh this is fascinating stuff uh, a whole slice of life that we uh, very seldom uh get a glimpse into um and uh we'll continue our conversation and ask you uh, to join in if you like at 866-55 press uh <laughs> Tell us about your prison experience. No, uh, <laughs> uh, you'd be amazed. A lot of families have had dealings with uh, members of their family who happen to be in prison at one time or another, or the things that you have read or heard, or someone you know maybe who works in a prison. Uh, Phil Glover here from the AFGE at 866-55 Press. This is the Bill Press Show. This is my computer.
computer? This is your computer. Let's go on the internet. Let's go. Flick it. Yes. Okay. I cursor in between the R and the E. Racing down a bunch of just push the period. She's gonna love me all over again. That's it. Jamaica, here you go. Here we go. <laughs> Good right. job. Thank you. Thank you. And I did it by myself. Feel smarter. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. All right, I know this isn't any fun to talk about, but we should. Okay, so who's going to do what? I'll pack the dead batteries. Great. I'll only put what I don't need into a duffel bag. Perfect, that's totally unhelpful. No problem. Meanwhile, I will try to comfort everyone by speaking in a calm voice. And I'll try to get the generator going without any gas. Oh, let's not forget the cell phones, which probably won't work. Right. And who is going to handle supplies? I can forget to do a list for us. Thanks, pal. Well, I think we couldn't be any less prepared. I'm proud of you guys. Talk to your kids about who call, where to meet, what to pack. Visit ready.gov slash kids for tips and information. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Thank you. Hey, listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. Thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm going to have to block you. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV. This is the Bill Press Show. And here we go with 11 minutes to go before the top of the hour in the next hour. Kevin Cirilli from Politica will be here as a friend of Bill. will be joined by Rodel Molineau, who's the president, had been the president, about to leave that post, uh, president of American Bridge. We're talking about the federal prisons and from the pro- some of the problems with uh, over st- uh, over uh, with overcrowding in the prisons or crowding in the prisons overpopulation I guess and the impact that that has on a lot of the correctional officers uh, who find themselves uh, underfunded and uh, uh, overworked I guess uh, Phil Glover former president of the Prisons Bureau Council of the AFGE here in uh, in studio with us. Uh, let's take a quick call here, Phil, if we can, from Billy down in uh, Glo- Cl- I'm sorry, Clover, South Carolina. Hey, Billy. Good morning. Hello. How you doing? Oh, we're doing good. Thanks for your call. What's your question? Yes, I would like to ask Mr. Glover. I know in South Carolina, they lock you up for a joint in South Carolina. If they cut back and, and you know, stop locking people up for small amounts of marijuana because they put you yep. in there and take you to prison, here if you get caught a couple of times even with a joint mm-hmm. and i was wondering would that not cut back on the crowd that's in the prisons and stuff yeah i know uh, there's like good. 13 states that have uh legalized it for medical use and then two states for uh leisure use yeah and i was just wondering if they would cut back that seemed to me like it would cut down a lot on the overcrowdedness 
Good, or, uh, good, yeah, good question, Billy. Hold on. Uh, so, Phil, how many, what percentage of these people in these prisons are on for, for just there for nonviolent crime, drug we have, use? We have a high, probably a high 40% that's in for drug drug offenses. That's, and that was all done through the 80s. Yeah, uh, yeah. They took away parole in 1987, which uh, there's really nothing uh, for an inmate to really work for. They get some good time through the years, but they don't have parole. Yeah. Um, that's a problem. But, yeah, we have over uh, a oh, very high crazy. amount. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. I mean, uh, that, that, that's, that, and that, that's that's something that Congress definitely ought to work well, on. Well, when I first started working in this system, there was about 50,000 inmates uh, in the entire federal system. There's over 217,000 now, and that's 23 years. Oh, good Lord. So that tells you well, kind of – Yeah. I think we had 40 institutions when I started, and we're well over 100 – I think 114. So Whoa. it's it has just exploded. We're going from fifty, I think we've I've seen this number. We I think we have more people in prison in this country than any other uh, per per capita, right? Than any other country in the. I think we do. On the planet. And then you have to look at your state systems and your counties yeah. and jails. That's where that other number comes from. But Debbie is up in uh, Worthington, Mass. Hey, Debbie. Good morning. Hi. Um, I my question was about uh, whether privatization comes into play. And does that mm-hmm. come under another line in the budget so that they could underfund uh, the federal prisons as they are now uh, and yeah. then put the money into another line? Another good question, privatization. We have, uh, we have numerous, about 14 federally uh, privatized facilities. Uh, our union has always spoken out against that practice. We think they're unaccountable. Uh, we don't believe that they're, they have oversight. Our director can be pulled up to Capitol Hill at any time and, and ask questions about treatment and those kind of things. Get the, get the uh, CEO of Geo Group or uh, Corrections Corporation of America to come to Capitol Hill and get beat on for, for a day or two. It doesn't happen. Uh, we do have a problem with those. We have a problem with their costs. As we've had to cut funding and positions, obviously their corporations just continue to run. And... You don't really know how they're handling their prisons, so that's that is a problem for us. No, I can see that too. I mean, you, you turn turn these facilities over to you know their their interest is going to be nothing about um, helping these people out or transition or whatever. It's just going to be pure bottom line. Right. It's right? all about it's all about the money in the stock market, and that's all they're they're worried about. Uh, and again, we've seen. We've seen problem after problem with private prisons, and uh, we we uh, discourage their use. You can find out more about uh, the good work in general of the AFGE under President uh, J. David Cox at afge.org, and I'm sure you've got a link there to something about the uh, the work of the correctional officers. Yes, right? we have a uh, link to the Safe Prison Project, is what it's called. If you go to the afg.org site and then Safe uh, Safe Prison Project. Safe Prison Project at afge.org. Phil, we'll let you go. Thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you. And thanks for your good work. It was a pleasure. Keep Thank yourself you. safe, man. Appreciate it. All right, I'll be back to tell you what the president's up to today. He's got on the road again. This is the Bill Press Show. In 1920s America, the Great Depression effectively erased consumer demand. Struggling manufacturers needed new ways to get Hmm. people buying again. Innovative production processes like stamping and use of moulds allowed them to use new materials for their designs. Products using vinyl, chrome, aluminium and plywood began appearing. American industrial designers began introducing streamlined, efficient shapes that shouted progress. Bel Geddes pioneered what we now refer to as utilitarian art. Things that had little reason to look sleek now all of a sudden did. At the 1939 World Fair featuring Bel Geddes' immensely popular Futurama exhibit, a new era of American industrial design proudly claimed to be building the world of tomorrow. Americans found great positivity in these futuristic forms. Things were looking up. American industrial designers realised that by making objects look great, people simply wanted them more. From cars to kitchen appliances, the most influential society on earth was spending money again. Mass consumption had arrived. Advertisers finally had lots to talk about. Personal taste could be expressed through the things you bought. Style became equally as important as function. 
Chair designers like Eames and Saarinen didn't just design seating, they created desirable lifestyles. People behind the product suddenly were stars. Everyone wanted to know who they were. Raymond Lowy was one of the shining lights of American industrial design. His face ended up on every coffee table in the nation. Toothpaste packaging promised whiter teeth. Washing powder packaging promised whiter whites. Who knew such simple household objects would shape the tastes and ambitions of an entire society? American industrial design improved America, functionally, culturally and intellectually, and exported it around the globe. All right, all right. I know you like the first two hours. A lot of good stuff to talk about. So much to talk about today that we have a third hour coming up. I know we lose you on Free Speech TV. Too bad, but there is uh, another option, and that is our video stream, Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker TV. And if you jump over there, you can continue to follow us with Kevin Cirilli from Politico. He'll be here for the entire hour as a friend of Bill. And then Rodel Molino, who's president of American Bridge, will be here talking about news of the day. So stay with us for hour number three. Is the Bill Press Show. President Obama on the road today. First, he uh, just about an hour from now will be leaving the White House, a little less, out to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he will tour a General Electric's gas engines plant in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Then he goes down to Nashville, Tennessee, where he'll be speaking this afternoon at the McCovac. Sen- um, no, it's not. A, yeah, McCovac High School in uh, Nashville. Uh, And then heading back tonight to the White House, arriving back at the White House about 8 o'clock. Jake Carney will be gaggling with reporters on Air Force One today, so there will be no briefing. In the next hour, Kevin Cirilli from Politico will be here as a friend of Bill. Lots more to talk about, so hang in there with us. This is the Bill Press Show.
Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. President Obama says that nobody who works for a living in the United States should be forced to live in poverty. So give America a raise. Taking that message on the road yesterday. Here we go. Oh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Bill Press Show in our third hour together this morning. Coming to you live Coast to coast, starting out here in Washington, D.C., in our studio on Capitol Hill, just down the street from the United States Capitol building. Uh, Again, President Obama, after the State of the Union Tuesday night, took his message uh, to a Costco up in uh, Atlanta, Maryland yesterday, and then out to a steel plant in Pittsburgh, near Pittsburgh, West Mifflin, Pennsylvania. This morning, he goes off to Milwaukee and then then down to Nashville, again with the... uh, as uh, every president does uh, after they give their message in the State of the Union, taking that message out on the road to the American people. 
Great to see you today. Whether you're uh, listening on your local progressive talk radio station, we welcome you. Glad to be here with you. Uh, and uh, also welcome those of you of wa- watching and following us on our video stream, Talker TV. It's a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Talker TV. Here we go for this last hour together here. Our regular team, of course, Peter Ogburn and Alisa Murphy. Hello, guys. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning. Alicia Cruz. She's got the, the phones covered, so give us a call. You can join the conversation at any time on any topic, 866-55-PRESS. Uh, and Cyprian Bolding, um, bouncing off uh, yesterday's birthday, um, big birthday for Cyprian. You know, it's I, he look he looks very good for fifty seven years old. He, he does, he does, yeah. And so I was, <laughs> I'm waiting for Cyprian to come in. No, not <laughs> quite. He's gonna throw something at me if he opens that door. Yeah, the duck. <laughs> not at all. He's a lot younger than that and a lot more handsome too. Uh, <laughs> Cyprian, uh, got the, he's got us looking good on the video. Cam- well, actually, now he's probably turning the cameras off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And joining oh, us, you made him mad now. Yeah, you joining mad. us at this hour as a friend of Bill from Politico, uh, Kevin Cerulli. Hello, Kevin. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me, and good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, you, I know, very excited about the State of the Union. Yeah. We want to we want to talk about that. John Stewart thought um, that uh, the president set a tone in dealing with 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 uh, with Congress um, that reminded him of. Um, well, it reminded him of his mother. Here's John Stewart. So the country is strong, but clearly the president's relationship with Congress is hurting. As he spoke to them, it was clear he had recently taken a course at the Learning Annex on passive aggression for Jewish mothers. If this Congress wants to help, work with me. I intend to keep trying with or without Congress. The question for everyone in this chamber is whether we are going to help or hinder this progress. I mean, I have a lot to do, but... um. <laughs> You know, you could help, or you could uh, be a disappointment to me. <laughs> Even though I at one time pushed you through my vagina. I mean, uh, you want to leave college? It's fine. What matters isn't what I want or the country, but the, what you, the little prince, the center of the universe. Be, be a dear. Get me my insulin from the cabinet. I'll, I'll inject myself. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on. It sort of had that uh, exaggerating, of course, but it sort of was okay. You know, look, we got things to do. Okay, <laughs> now I'd like to work with you, but if you're not willing to work with me, damn it, I'm going to do it on my yeah, own. Yeah, no, I think I think it really kind uh, of <clears throat> said essentially that he's the, in the second term. He. Uh, wants to be the dominant force in American politics. You know, uh, he's got to be careful, though, because, you know, Congress has a dismal approval rating. It's like in the single digits. If it's if it's not, it's like 10 or 11 percent. But President Obama also a 43 percent approval rating, the lowest it's been uh, for him. And, 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 And as we head into a midterm election year, I I think it was you did start to kind of see a lot of that. Uh campaign, not campaign type of rhetoric, but he's going to be, I think, the face of the Democratic Party as we head into the midterms. And he took Obamacare head on in that State of the Union address. And it got from the Democrats, which I was really watching carefully, a huge applause. Uh, Democrats were on their feet during that moment. And it was as if to say, game on, you want to hit us on Obamacare, we're all united on it, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is to, it, it, 43% is lower than it should be for a president at this time in his, in, his, uh, in his second term. At the same time, the people sitting in front of him have an <laughs> approval rating, you know, of the single digits, as yeah. you say. So uh, it could... Um, He's he's doing a hell of a lot, of be- a lot better uh, than they are. Anyhow, we're, we've got uh, a lot to cover in the politics of the day and uh, the more fallout from the uh, State of the Union. Don't forget, you can call us anytime at 866-55-PRESS. Uh, Rodel Molino, the president of American Bridge, will be joining me and Kevin a little bit later in the hour. Uh, we'll get right to it. But first... This is the Full Court Press. Just a couple of other stories making news. Gentlemen, the uh, Nobel Prize is going to be announced in October, so we've got a lot of time. But mm-hmm. as you know, people can sort of nominate their mm-hmm. entries all throughout the year. Well, two Norwegian politicians have given their name for who they believe should win the Nobel Prize. And that name is Edward Snowden. 
Oh, wow. Edward Snowden has been nominated by two Norwegian politicians. What they said in their statement was, we do not, quote, we do not necessarily condone or support all of his disclosures. We are, however, (laughs) convinced that the public debate and changes in policies that have followed in the wake of Snowden's whistleblowing has contributed to a more stable and peaceful world order. Uh You know who I think it'll be, though? It'll be the rock star, the Pope. He was on the cover of Rolling you know Stone what? this month. You know, a, I'm, I'm calling it here on the Bill Press show. It's not until October. You're yeah. calling it like I'm nine calling months it early. Way <laughs> early. But I, I bet you it's the Pope. Uh, I, we're going to remember that, and I think you may very well be right. I think you could he be right. Cover rock of star. Rolling Stone. Yeah, cover, yeah, I know. No yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. I've got a better idea. President Obama could just give Snowden his <laughs> Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize. Oh. Yeah. Well, that would be awkward if they have like all the winners at some sort of a luncheon uh, somewhere. Bill, are you suggesting that? That or are you making news right now? You think that President Obama should should give Edward Edwards. Snowden his <laughs> Nobel Peace Prize? Is that what you're saying? I'm just suggesting it would be a nice gesture because I know he values so much the contribution yeah. uh, of the, the public Mr. service uh, that, that, Mr. Pu- that Edwards, Mr. Snowden, Mr. Snowden. provided. Yes. Some advice that maybe he wasn't looking for. Congressman Michael Grimm, after threatening to throw a reporter Jerk. off the balcony and break him in half, well, he's getting some advice this morning. He might not exactly want it. New York Daily News has an op-ed written by Anthony Weiner. says, Anthony Weiner's advice to Representative <laughs> Michael Grimm on how to get along with reporters. He says he's seen the tape, he knows the reporter, and he knows Michael Grimm. He thinks they're both good guys. Says that they need to both learn from this incident, but he tells him to basically yeah. be nice. When to you need board. help from <laughs> Anthony Weiner, you you, 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 you might as well just get out. I'm right? gonna plead the fifth. Nothing that I can say would be can come from my comments. No good. Can come <laughs> I'm gonna plead the fifth on this <laughs> okay. one. Okay, fair enough. Can you, uh, that's pretty embarrassing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, Justin Bieber has even gotten in more trouble. No. He is facing an assault charge in Toronto. and Police say that he is going to turn himself in. The assault charge comes from uh, in December when he allegedly assaulted a limo driver that was driving him. And the Toronto police said that they, they expect him to turn himself in. So he's got the charges in Miami. Now he's got this thing in Toronto. This is in Toronto? This is in Toronto. What was, he, the, what was he out drinking with the mayor? I was going to say the mayor <laughs> in Toronto might get you know, hired for a cabinet <laughs> position or something. Right. Like yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I want to know is, you know, he got in all this trouble with the eggs. I don't know. He was like egging his yeah. neighbor's house, twenty thousand yep. dollars. How many eggs did he use? <laughs> like that is so many eggs. He like, was where, using ostrich eggs. Well, I mean. Where do you get that many eggs? Like, like I just have. Oh, I just I don't know. He was throwing Fabergé eggs. That's what the problem was. <laughs> yeah, that's where all the damage came from. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, important news of the day. Yes, indeed. You got it. Uh, So, Kevin, what was interesting, so the president, in effect, it was a very defiant President Obama, right? And and as we just said a couple of minutes ago, saying to Congress, we got a lot lot on our plate, okay? And I want to get these things done, and I prefer to work with you, I want to work with you, but if you don't, as to use this phrase, I'm not going to stand still, I'll do stuff by executive order. Pen right? and phone. Using you know? my, my yeah. pen and my phone. Um, is this is this the right approach for this president, or is he left with the fact that he has just basically no choice? You know, when, when President Obama first took office, and, and even at the end of his first term, a criticism from inside the Beltway was that he didn't have relationships with Congress and that those relationships hindered his ability to put forth his agenda. You know, he was only a freshman senator before being elected. And I think now what we saw in the State of the Union address was an embrace of that and and really owning, if you will, who he is. And essentially, he's going to do executive orders as he as he heads out uh, of, of office, and and so I think it is essentially uh, him uh, announcing his leadership style that he that he's going to have for for the remainder of his term. But if uh, Republicans indeed have adopted, which I think they have, basically their strategy, they think their best strategy is oppose, 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 oppose. Right? I yeah. mean, even stuff that they've they raise the minimum wage under George Bush. No big deal. Now it's a huge deal, and they won't do it. They 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 extended. Um, they raised the debt ceiling seven mm-hmm. times, seven times with no strings attached under George W. Bush. Now they won't do it unless they get a huge pound of flesh. They're not even sure what they want. So it, it's oppose, oppose, oppose. If that is what the attitude they're going to take, 
really Obama doesn't have any other option, does he? Uh, well, except do nothing. I think we're at a at a transition point with this Congress. Uh, I, I I think that the the government shutdown really was a huge moment for the Republican Party, if you will, to regroup. If you uh, for for lack of a better term, after making a huge mistake. Well, to and and I think that after that government shutdown, you know, we have seen a lot of bipartisan type of work. There's talk that immigration reform might might get moved through. Uh, there, I haven't seen it yet. We did uh, we see it, we did it. see it on the budget. Senator Marco Rubo, Rubio, a rising Republican star from Florida, getting a shout out from the president during a State of the Union address. There's that. I think that the bipartisan budget agreement from Senator Patty Murray, Representative Paul Ryan, uh, that budget agreement which prevents another government shutdown mm-hmm. really speaks. To this uh, sentiment as well, and everything that I'm hearing about a- another debt ceiling showdown is that there won't be one, and so I think that there really kind of seems to be uh, some some sort of more bipartisanship making its way. How long that's going to last as we get closer to the midterms is anybody's guess, but I do think that Obamacare will continue to be talked about. Um, as well as this larger government overreach, Big Brother NSA. Now, you, you mentioned uh, Obamacare, and I was going to ask you about that, because um, the president kind of jokes, saying, hey, by the way, um, uh, you know, it's, it's saying that all Americans deserve access to health insurance. And he said, oh, by the way, in case you haven't heard, we've been working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the line where he said, you know, look, if you got some ideas, I'm, I'm open. Yeah. But let's not have another 47 votes to repeal it. You know what's interesting is that afterwards, uh, after the State of the Union address, when all the law ma- lawmakers file out and they're talking to all the media members, Senator Chuck Schumer had a really interesting point that I think might illustrate from a strategic standpoint where the Democrats are kind of headed in a midterm year. And he said the midterm election will not be about Obamacare. It will be about income inequality and who is able to convince the middle class that they are able to get them out of, of uh, the, the, the recession. And, and so I, I think what I interpreted that to mean is that the Democrats don't want it to be about Obamacare. They want it to be about things like raising the minimum wage, uh, uh, equal pay for, for women and equal opportunity in the workplace, because that they feel is a much stronger argument than the Republicans hitting them on Obamacare. Right. Actually, I, I would argue to, that if you that they all they're all part of the same mix. If you're talking about helping the middle class, yeah. doing something about income inequality, it is the minimum wage. It is income inequality. It's the apprenticeship programs, jobs programs, which the president was talking about. You know, it's uh, again unemployment insurance. It's equal pay for equal work for women, and it's access to health insurance. You know, it's kind of. All and, of those things, and, rather than just focusing on Obamacare, perhaps. And it's a really tough argument to make if you're against raising them. It's, it's just a tough political argument to make if you're against raising the minimum wage, right? Because, you know, the, there, I think that there are valid points on both sides. I don't think anyone would disagree with the validity of some of them. But it is in a midterm election year to be against raising the minimum wage. It, it's tough. And, and, I, and I think that it, it, it's... Uh, you know, it's remarkable that this is the time that that ever that Congress has decided to. Kind of take I, that. I I think it's suicidal for Republicans to take that uh, that position. I don't think they're getting anything for it. We're just getting into uh, some of the big issues here in the State of the Union and uh, what's on the president's plate and the message that he is taking uh, around the country. Eight six six fifty five press is our toll free number. Join the conversation here with Kevin Surly from Politico Politico dot com. This is the Bill Press Show.
is the Bill Press Show. 25 minutes after the hour, here we go. Kevin Cerulli here from Politico as a friend of Bill this hour. Uh, the president challenging Congress uh, to step up to the plate on immigration reform and the minimum wage and extending unemployment insurance, among other goals. And if they don't, he says he will do whatever he can by executive order uh, kind of to, to keep the agenda moving. Uh, Kevin, we got l- lots of people on, on the line this morning here, so let's uh, let's say a quick hello here to Denise. Denise calling from Kankakee, Illinois. Hi, Hi Denise. Denise. Hi, how are you today, Hi. Bill? Good. Question or comment? Comment. Yes. I watched the State of the Union, and I thought it was a great State of the Union on behalf of President Obama. I watched all of the reactions before oh. and after. Uh-huh. I made the big mistake of, after watching it, I wanted to just turn on, and please don't slam the phone down when I tell Uh-oh. you what I did. Uh-oh. I turned on Fox News just no. to see what their reaction would be. Yeah. And it was, typ- it was just a typical same propaganda. It was like night and day. They watched it. They all clapped. They all skin and grinned in President Obama's face like, we're going to work together, yay. And then it was like watching kids fighting as soon as they get out of kindergarten. I, I'm so disheartened by this administration not working together. It makes me sick. I just retired, and I'm moving from Illinois, and I can't tell you how happy I was if he made one point in the whole State of the Union was that he now will execute executive action. And if he doesn't yeah. do that, I'm going to be so angry but okay. he has to do that, and he has to do it now. All right. Thanks, Denise. I, I, I appreciate your call. I don't mean to cut you off, but I just want to be sure we get a, a time for a comment from Kevin before we have to break here. Um, at, at the, I, I had the feeling, you know, that the, the, the viewer numbers were down, record yeah. low for people watching the State of the Union. And I think Denise sort of touched on it because I think people have kind of given up on Washington. Yeah, right? I grew up outside of Philly, and, like, nobody cares. I mean, people are worried about the economic issues that are affecting them and, and their pocketbook and 
you know, and uh, I, so I, I think that definitely there is that sentiment that's just lingering post recession. Um, she mentioned that she had just retired, and the president actually unveiled a new retirement program uh, that will be. Uh, through executive action in which he's encouraging folks who don't have retirement programs to actually invest in treasury bonds. I thought it was interesting. And mm -hmm. so, you know, retirement issues, I think, are going to be making a comeback in Congress as well. But I, I think people see they just they, they've gotten almost hardened um, to the fact that um, that this Congress is not going to cooperate kind of on anything. So they don't expect anything to happen. And so I think they a lot of them just tuned out Tuesday night to say no matter what he says. Yeah. There's not going to be any progress. When we come back, Rodel Molino from this American Bridge is joining the Bill us. Press Show.
radio, on TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. About 33 minutes after the hour, here we go, the Bill Press Show. Coming to you live from our nation's capital and brought to you today by the International Association of Machinists, the good men and women of the Machinist Union under President Tom Buffenbarger. Our sisters and brothers sharpening America's edge on the global economy, you bet. And for more information, you can find out about their good work at their website, goiam.org, G-O-I-A-M.org. Kevin Cerulli from Politico. Here we're covering the the day's news and the rollout still from the State of the Union address and the president's uh, kind of vow to go it alone if necessary. Kevin Cerulli from Politico. Here's a friend of Bill. Thank you for having me. Kevin, again, thanks for coming in. And hang on, uh, hang on around course. for the whole hour. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, we're joined now by American Bridge is a great organization formed about three years ago uh, to uh, put some juice and some muscle into uh, uh, electing good Democrats here in the uh, in not just in Washington but around the states. Um, I guess the founding father, right, Rodell? Uh, Would you call yourself that? Yeah, well, actually, David Brock, our chairman, is the founding father, but uh, I've been there since the beginning, uh, building it as the president. So, Yeah, yeah. president from the beginning, Rodell Molyneux, here in studio with us. And you are about to step down as president of American Bridge. I am. Uh, Why? Well, all good things must come to an end. Uh, I am, uh, like I said, I've been there for three years and uh, helped build it. And I think it's in a great place. And so I'm moving on. I'm going to join the ranks of uh, the consulting class. But I won't be too, (laughs) Uh, I I will not be too far. I know, yeah, quote unquote, this town. Um, (laughs) uh, I won't be too far away from American Bridge because I will continue to consult uh, for them. They are a client. Um, but also, I am on. Uh, I was just elected to the board of directors of American Bridge. And so American Bridge just had a I move. will continue to. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, so uh, I will still continue to be uh, to be closely associated with them, and I'm really proud of the work that we did, and uh, very thankful for uh, David, our chairman, for the opportunities that he gave me. We have. Um, we've been talking, uh, Kevin and I, about the State of the Union. The president seems, particularly the president's vow to use uh, executive order mm-hmm. uh, where necessary. I want to come back to that, and we've got, I see some other callers, and we'll have more calls coming up on that at 866-55-PRESS. Uh, but just one more question on American Bridge. Sure. So looking at 2014, mm-hmm. what are your m- main priorities for 2014? I mean, there's so many races this year. Governor's races, state legislative yeah. races, House races, Senate races. Uh, yeah, I think you just said it. It's all of that. Uh, you, know, what we're, <laughs> you know, what we're looking Pretty at is... ambitious we'll, agenda. We want to make sure that uh, Harry Reid continues to be the uh, Senate Majority Leader, so we're looking at targeted Senate races. Uh, we believe that there is a chance to take back the House, so uh, we're right now in, I believe, 15 House races. Um, and then, I think you, uh, you hit the nail on the head. You started talking about some of these governor's races and state races. I mean, listen, some of the things that are going on in these state capitals that uh, Republicans are getting away with, um, you know, these Tea Party uh, conservative governors that were elected four years ago, Rick Scott, Rick Snyder, John Kasich, I mean, they're all coming up for uh, election this year. We're going to focus on them as well. And then last but not least, it's still, uh, it's not too early to start looking at early presidential, uh, Chris Christie, Marco Rubio, so on and so forth. I have a question about that. What, what is that? Um, yeah, there's some little, uh, uh, I, I can hear there's a Peter coming to the rescue here. Did. Kevin, go ahead. I have ahead. a question about the last half of what you said about about the early 2016 buzz about uh, Hillary Clinton. In fact, front page of the Washington Post today, Clinton holds a big Democratic lead um, among her challengers. A 73% of Democrats polled, according to this poll, want her in 2016. But do you think that... You know, I know you guys have been you've launched a correct the record campaign for on on Benghazi for her. But is there is there a concern that perhaps it would restrict a Democratic primary from folks like Senator Elizabeth Warren or some other rising uh, Democratic stars from a primary process? Well, I mean, I, I can't speak for Elizabeth Warren. All I can uh, say is what she said, which is that she isn't going to run. But her um, aside, but other candidates from a primary process. No, I don't think so. Listen, if 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 Democrats want to run in a primary, then I think that they should. Uh, no one has come out and said that they uh, that, that they no. did. And I read that too poll early. too. And yeah, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and listen, I, I don't think that there needed to to be a poll to know that there are a lot of people in this country, <laughs> you know, both Democrats and I also think independents uh, that are very fond of uh, Hillary Clinton and would like to see her run for president. But do you think there will be challengers to Hillary in a primary? 
I don't know. I mean, as of right now, uh, you know, Secretary Clinton hasn't even announced that she's running. So, I mean, yeah. all of this is all speculative. Yeah. Yes. But there is a lot of talk about uh, about uh, the possibility that she might be being coy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it, last Sunday's New York Times. I have to tell you my own take uh, on this, uh, and I say this. Uh, we're doing a little. Yeah, okay, uh, <laughs> a little. We like our engineer Peter Ogburn is here in the studio helping us out with a little sound problem here. Uh, my own take on this is I I. I don't want to see any attention at all to 2016 this year. I mean, mm -hmm. I think people ought to focus on what is up right now because it's so important. I would rather see uh, some good Democratic governors elected mm -hmm. get rid of some of these Tea Party people so that so that we've we've covered our base in terms of reapportionment mm -hmm. and and focus on that and focus on winning back the House as is as a Democrat now. Kevin, and I know you're right in the middle, but Rodell and I, Rodell and I are Democrat, uh, active Democrats, and focus on on uh, at least holding on to the Senate. Right, I'm not oh, going to pick up any seats, but those to me are the priorities. 2016, we got time for 2016. Listen, this is the way that first I look things at. first. I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And listen, I agree. I I really I used to work for uh, Senator Harry Reid. I'd love to see him continue to yeah, be majority leader, and I, and I think that he will. Um, and I think that we do have a shot at the uh, at the House. The the importance I think of the early 2016 for people like Christie, who's kind of shot himself in the foot, but others is that this is the time of the uh, of the election cycle, the presidential election cycle, where a lot of these uh, people on the Republican side who are thinking about running are starting to scrub their record, starting to rebuild their narratives. And we want to make sure that people know, that voters know what these guys really stand for. So that's um, why we're spending uh, a little bit of time right now. I'm saying this, my, just my two cents is we'll <laughs> have time to do that, man. But Focus I, on on the now. I got my eye on the ball. Rodell, I think what you said was interesting. You mentioned in the same breath as the New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, you also mentioned Senator Marco Rubio, who mm -hmm. I think... Uh, in the past couple of weeks has seen a resurgence of sorts. And if uh, the if the if Congress, the, the president giving him a shout out during the State of the Union address, mm -hmm. uh, I think if he Congress, look very happy. At that, I, <laughs> I think if yeah. Congress uh, yeah. takes up immigration reform, he's going to be one of the rising or one of the driving Republicans behind well, that. If he if he makes up his mind whether he's for it or against it, because he was for it. And then he then he was then he came out kind of a. a distance himself from that. Yeah, he got a lot of pressure from uh, from, right. from 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 his base and you know, I could have put Scott Walker in that sentence. Rubio is just the first one that came up. It's uh, you know, I'm not a I'm definitely I definitely can't tell you what the Republicans are going to pick, you know. <laughs> one week it's Christie, the other week it's, you know, Ted Cruz and I can't think of, you know, two different people as far as personalities go. So Senator Rand knows? Paul. Senator Rand Paul, you know. Um, they've mean, all had a great couple of weeks the last couple of weeks. All three of them. <laughs> uh, Repu Republicans yeah. are good at that. They uh they, they like to audition everybody. I remember Herman Cain, Michelle Bachman, everyone got a got a turn at the top in uh in the 2012 election. Here we go. Um, we'll, uh, we'll come back to this, not leaving this, but uh, I do want to get some of the calls in here. On uh, We've talked to State of the Union, the president's big push uh, for the use of executive order. He's going to do so for sure on the minimum wage and uh, on some uh, energy-related issues, too, though, and climate change. We, he wasn't specific about what he's going to do in that area. Uh, across the board, what do you think? Mark calling from out in Chicago. Hello, Mark. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? Hey, great. Thanks for holding on there. What's your point or comment? My well, it's more of a question. My right. thing is, is if you if you look at Obama's you know entire term, he's made a lot of mistakes, and that's just you know easy to say. But this year, it seems like in his State of the Union, he's really put it to the point that he's trying to you know fix his legacy. Is the way that I personally feel, and he's doing that by trying to make this his year of action. Well, the whole thing about it is he's got this huge beast of a Republican Party causing, you know, an American bar fight with the entire thing. So they have the pause button on everything yep. that they can, and, you know, they're happy with that. As long as no decisions are being made, they're happy. They're making right. their money, and they don't, they don't mind. So, you know, my question is, is to, I guess, make his year of action effective— how do you upset the Republican Party to where they're not happy, to where they're forced to make decisions, to where, you know, these things and problems, they, they're not just talking in a fight. Okay. They're actually going to be, you know, handled. And All right. I got a uh, good question, and I've got your question. Uh, so is there any way the president can make the Republicans come to the table and cooperate? 
no, on issues. No, and and um, you know, going to the caller, uh, I I don't know about many mistakes, but if you know, if there was one mistake, if you're going to be honest, um, and it, that the president made is that he spent a lot of time believing in the fact that Republicans in Congress would would start being sensible and come to the table. And here we are now in uh, in, in 2014, uh, and you see the uh, the years of obstruction that the president uh, endured. You know, the other side to that is you know the president's ability to communicate to the American people that he was working to make America stronger mm -hmm. in juxtaposition to Republicans. I think is one of the reasons why um, he was elected. Why we have the majority that we have in the Senate right now. So uh, can he? Uh, it, how, how do you get? How, how can you can you force Republicans to work together with well, him? You know, I think that all of this inside the Beltway, all like the, the the I think we got to think about what people are actually talking about in bars, like the the caller mentioned, and and in Philly where I'm from, and and you know in Chicago and everywhere. And I think the larger narrative is a couple months ago the government was shut down, okay, and then a healthcare website was had a rocky rollout. And I think now there is a, a bipartisan plan with Representative Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray that arguably would prevent another government shutdown. I think that plan is a signal to folks that perhaps things are a little bit more bipartisan now. But we're right around the corner from a midterm election. It's not going to last. There will be battle lines drawn. Um, but I do think that this NSA big brother, big government narrative is something the Republicans are going to try to push. I think the Democrats on the flip side are going to also push equal pay, income inequality, minimum wage. Yeah, but I think the, the, the quick answer to the, to the question that Mark raised is no. You can't. I mean, if Republicans <laughs> decide something is in their best political interest, Democrats do. they might be willing to, to, come, to, come, to come around. Um, but other than that, uh, they're not going. They're, they're not going to. That's why the president said, "Hell, I'll do it on my own." That's Executive true. order. We'll be right back with um, both Kevin Cirilli and uh, Rodell Molino here, and your calls still coming up at eight six six fifty five press. This is the Bill Press Show.
All right, we got 10 minutes before the top of the hour on this Thursday, January 30. Uh, the Bill Press Show coming to you live nationwide on your local progressive talk radio station and on our video stream uh, at YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash talker TV. Uh, we uh, have uh, the last count 21 people from 21 different countries watching the video stream. Wow. So. I want you to know, uh, the coolest country Kevin country? Cirilli and uh, Rodel Marv- Molino here in studio. You are big in Belarus right now, All as right. we're speaking. Whoa. Oh, Belarus, global. how about that? <laughs> we're global. <laughs> you, you know, you'll be getting fan mail from uh, Belarus. <laughs> Hello to Belarus. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we So as we move into um, in, into this 2014, do you think it's possible, Rodel, to get uh, the, 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 to the caller's point about this kind of gridlock, do you think mm-hmm. it's possible to, to, to get anything done? Immigration reform, it's probably the maybe the most likely, right? Because as somebody pointed out, and I love this, Democrats want it and Republicans need it. Exactly. So. I mean, it's one of those things, and I think you said it right before uh, we went to break, which is if Republicans deem that it is in their political necessity, then I think that you get it done. I don't think maybe you get it done for the right reasons, which is that we have a broken immigration system and it needs to get taken care of. But, but so if you, it get, it done, be, you get it done, you get it done. Then you yeah. get it done, you get it done. Listen, I think the greatest thing that I heard in the in the State of the Union, I think the president has been very patient over uh, the last uh, over the last five, six years and is now saying I'm going going alone on some of these things and if you're not going to help me I'm going to do this uh, myself and uh, I think that's actually good for the country I know there's some people in Congress that are calling him an imperial president but hey guess what you had five six years to uh, to work with him and you uh, turned your nose at him so you can't blame him now Kevin you cover the Congress this would uh, if whatever he does by executive order President Obama will hardly be the first president to use executive order right I think presidents all the time have used executive order I I, I I think it it it'll it will be interesting to see what exactly a lot of these executive orders are but I mean I, I think the biggest one uh, that that we're seeing is the minimum wage and with uh, his executive order on that front I think it does kind of put pressure on Congress to take up the issue so again from a strategic standpoint instead of having a relationship with Congress, he essentially is using his, the power of his pen to get to force something, which was the dominant story in all of the coverage, was the minimum wage issue, to put pressure on lawmakers to, to take it. So I think I, he's exerting a lot of influence in a different way that I don't think we've seen before. I thought it was also interesting in talking about the minimum wage. Before he challenged Congress to act, he challenged business leaders to act, and he had that one man from the the pizza chain, I think, down yeah. in Georgia, uh, who had just given his employees a healthy minimal, uh, healthy wage increase. And he said, "So, so you can do this on your own." States, se- several states mm-hmm. have have already raised a minimum wage on their own, right? Well, yeah. Well, so listen, the president you- said, "You know, yeah, we want Congress to act, but we're all going to do what we can, even without Congress." Yeah. Well, listen, when you're talking about, you know, economic opportunity and fairness and income inequality, you know, listen, American productivity is up, profits are up, but yet, you know, I mean, you've got the wealthiest CEOs making much more money than their workers, and there's something wrong with that. Um, and, you know, to, to the point on uh, the the minimum wage, the executive order for federal contractors, and what are, I think this is great strategically, because what are Republicans, Republicans going to say? How dare you do something that w- if you would have brought to Congress, we were going to block? You know, I mean, it, it puts them in a bad position. Yeah. Uh, the, the conversation is just starting. A lot of rollout from the minimum wage. You sort of, sort of, pres- president set the agenda. We'll see how it plays out. And um, we got a good start this morning, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Always fun to have you here. Thanks. And thanks particularly for the whole hour. And Rodell, good luck in your uh, future career. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you again for all that you've done at uh, American Bridge too. I appreciate it. Thank I'll you. be back with a quick parting shot about a an American hero. This is the Bill Press Show.
The Parting Shot with Bill Press. This is The Bill Press Show. And just a quick final word about the great Pete Seeger who left us this week at the age of 94. Few people have left such a mark in their lifetime. Think about it, his great songs. If I had a hammer, where have all the flowers gone? Turn, turn, turn. As a young man, I remember marching alongside of Pete Seeger through the streets of San Francisco singing This Land is Your Land as he led us in protesting the war in Vietnam. Later, he adopted the Hudson River as his cause, and he gets a lot of the credit for cleaning up that river. Pete Seeger died this week, but his power will always live on in his songs and all the great causes that he fought for. That's our show for today, folks. Thanks for being with us, and come on back again tomorrow. A lot of fun on a Friday. We'll see you then. This is The Bill Press Show.